2019. So I started from this because the, the past papers that I have after that already have the answers for it, so I could just send it to you all. All right, so let we look at um, section A, question one. Figure one is a diagram of a transformer. Name the parts labeled X, Y, and Z. Okay, so um, just to give you a basic to know how a transformer works. So the transformer, what it does is that it converts voltage. It could either increase voltage or it could lower voltage. This is actually dependent on the ratio of coils. So if we're looking at, at this picture here, we could see that there are one, two, three turns of this um, primary coil, and there's one, two, three, four turns of this secondary coil here. So what that does is that because there's more turns of the coil, this, um, this is a step of transformer because on the secondary side there's more turns and what that does is that it increases the voltage if it was reverse and had more turns on the left side and less turns on the right side it'd be a step down which means that it decreases the, vo the voltage the power is actually equal on both sides theoretically for ideal transformer so when voltage is increased current is actually decreased and vice versa when voltage is decreased current is increased but they asked me now that here, what they're just asking us here is to label it. So for X, so transformers require an AC power source. So this would be an AC power source. For Y, so remember this, this is the primary coil. These are the, sec this is the secondary coil or the secondary turns of that coil. And Z, so in order for this process to work right what has to happen is a process called electromagnetic induction what that means is that when you have a, a, an ac power source alternating current power source what it does is that it temporarily magnetizes this core this core is usually made up of soft iron so why iron and not steel for example iron is temporarily magnetized which means that it can magnetize if there's current running through it and demagnetize if current is not running through it, um, as opposed to steel, which is permanently magnetized. So anyway, so this is this is our soft iron core. Usually this would be laminated to prevent um, current from seeping across, that's called eddy currents. All right, so let me look at the next one. All right, so the graph work. I'm not really gonna do the graphs because they'll take up too much too much um time but i will i will work it out and i'll show you like the the basics of how the graph is supposed to be so if you look here we could see that the city transformer shown in figure one was tested and the values for the primary voltage vp and the secondary voltage vs were obtained the data is shown in table one below table one values for primary and secondary voltage so if we look here we could see that for example if we take this value three volts on the primary side and 26 volts on the secondary side we could see that is a step up transformer because it actually increased in the voltage so and we could see that um, here as well so you can see five volts on the primary side and 45 on the secondary side now you'll actually notice something happening here um this is increasing at almost a rate of, of nine times because five could go into 45 nine times that is what they call the turn ratio turn ratio of nine so every time the voltage is is is, is increased it increases by nine times in this particular one so for example if you see in three we've got three times nine is 27 in this case it's 26 because you have like losses due to heat and thing if you look at um, 8, 8 by 9 is 72. So that is actually what the gradient is going to give you. In this case, it's going to give you the, um, the turns ratio. So I'm not going to draw the graph or anything, but um, you all know if you say plot the graph of Vs against Vp, Vs would go on the y-axis and Vp would go on the x-axis. I will work out the gradient just using things for the table though. So I will just take the um I'll take some values here. So I'll take these two. All 
right? And remember, this is this is the y-axis, and this is the x-axis, right? So determine the gradient S for the graph. So, so the gradient, and y'all could work it out as I go in here as well. So the gradient is going to be y2 minus y1. So that's going to be the readings of secondary voltage. Remember, Vs is the y-axis divided by x2 minus x1. So for it, plug in any numbers there, what would y2 do? So y2 would be 72. What would y1 be? Remember, you're looking at Vs. So Y1 is going to be 45. Looking at the X axis now, which is the, the um, primary voltage, what would X2 be? Well, X2 is going to be 8. And what is X1 going to be? Well, X1 is going to be 5. If I work this out in my calculator, well, we know 8 minus 5 is 3, so 72 minus 45 is 27, divided by 3.0, or just 3. And if you're doing a calculator for this, if you work this out, your gradient is going to be 9. Now, there's not going to be any um, unit for this, and you might be wondering why there's no unit, but this is because the y-axis unit is V volts, and the x-axis unit is volts. They will cancel each other out, so there's no unit. And again, what does this 9 represent? It represents the turns ratio. In this case, how many times the voltage is stepped up in the secondary turns, the secondary point. And you can see that that is four marks. And just to reiterate what would be marks for this is not just the work in here, but on your graph, you know, you have to show which points you use and use a little triangle to, to connect them. So as I not join the graphs, what, what I'm doing is I'll just do the work in for it. Um, the ones that if I have to pinpoint a specific point on the graph, I'll just skip those. Again, it'll take up too much time. All right. So the question here is now, use the gradient, use the gradient S, so S, S was for slope, right? To calculate the following. The number of turns in the secondary coil NS, given that the number of turns in the primary coil NP is equal to 85. Okay, so Rambo was said, the, the 9 that we just calculated is the turns ratio. What that means is that it will have 9 times more voltage, 9 times more coils on the secondary side. So this is actually not, not hard at all. And what I'll do is that I'll... Um, let me see if I could... Nah, there's no way for me to really work it out with the other way, but so I'm going to use the gradient to work it out. And so this is going to be like this. So I'm gonna say the number of secondary turns is going to be the gradient times the number of primary turns. That's simple. That will just be nine times 85. And if we work that out, so the number of turns that would um, be on the secondary side. Remember, that will be nine times the amount on the, on the primary side. That's what the gradient represents. So that's going to be 765 turns. So for example, if I only had one turn on the primary coil, I would have nine turns on the secondary to generate nine times more voltage. It, it directly proportional so to speak all right so let's look at this one now so calculate the current in the secondary coil is if the current in the primary coil ip 
is equal to 1.8 amps. So let me explain again what that turns ratio means. So remember I said it does a kind of trade with the current and the voltage. So if the voltage is increased nine times, the current is going to decrease nine times. And this is because of the law of conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed, uh, but can only be converted into different forms. So I can't just get nine times more voltage out of nowhere. I have to trade that for current. So whereas the the electrical the, the electrical wave becomes more, more powerful, it becomes stronger, it also becomes slower, right? Or passes at a slower rate. So how, how do I do this? Well, this too is not, this is not hard. So what we'll say is that um, the current in the secondary coil, IS, is going to be equal to, so we just have to take 1.8, well, we're going to say IP, and divide that by the gradient. So what is that? So that'll be 1.8. And if you remember what the gradient was, the gradient was 9. And let's put that out there. So 1.8 divided by 9. That is equal to 0.2 amperes. Right? So once again, let me say I had a turns ratio of 10. If the voltage increased 10 times, the current is going to decrease by 10 times. So in that case, there we can say the current is inversely proportional in a transformer. All right, so let's look at this one here. Calculate the power output E out of the transformer given that the secondary volt, sorry, given that the voltage in the secondary coil Vs is equal to 55 volts. Well, this one is actually pretty simple. All you have to do is just work out for power, knowing the, the voltage and knowing the, um, the current. So this is just a simple calculation. That will just say P is equal to, and if you remember, power is current times voltage. So P is equal to IV. So what, what is the current in the um, secondary coil? Well, that would have been what we just worked out, right? So that would be 0 0.2. And what is the voltage in the secondary coil? Well, well that would be what they, they gave to us here, which would be 55. So let's work that out now. So we just say 0.2 times 55. And what you're supposed to get now is 11. And what would be your, what is going to be your, your unit? Well, remember, it's power, right? So power is going to be in watts. So 11 watts. Always make sure to have a unit let's say, because remember, those count as a mark as well. And that there's question one. I say I didn't do the graph, but we could work out the stuff without doing the graph. The graph again is just you, you all of course should be accustomed to doing that. Okay, let's look at question two. Question two A. Complete table two by a, by inserting the appropriate physical quantities and derive SI units. Okay, so for volume, the volume is length by breadth by height so that is going to be meters cubed i can't put the tree so i'm just going to put this here meters cubed okay so we have a next quantity now <clears throat> where the unit is kill the is kilogram per meter cube so kilogram is mass a meter cube is volume. And if you think about what represents mass over volume, well, that's going to be density. All right, so here we have the, new, the, the unit as a newton, and this one should be easy. The physical quantity is force. All right, so here we have a, a slightly tricky one. We have the physical quantity being pressure. And we have derived units now. So we have 
two derived units. So you might be like, well, um, what's the other one? Well, we have to remember that um, the first unit that we're going to put here, which is the Pascal, is based on the formula for pressure. And remember, the formula for pressure is force divided by area. And force is newtons, and area is meter squared. So if you have force over area, that is going to be newtons per meter squared. So if you put this here, newtons per meter squared. Right? Where this two would just be a small little two on top of force. So that's a simple one. Okay, so let's look at this one here. The concrete block shown in figure three was made with cement. And what can we see here? We can see three dimensions. We have the length, which is two meters, the width, which is 140 centimeters. So that's the note there because this will have to convert to meters. And we have a height, which is in which is three meters. Right? So let me mark those things there. So we have a length. We have a height and we have a, a width. And we're going to say that this is not 140 centimeters, so we're about to convert centimeters to meters. Centi means 100, so you divide it by 100. So this is actually going to be 1.4 meters. So the question here is now calculate the density of the concrete block. Given that its mass is 20,160 kilograms. So you have to remember the formula for density is mass divided by volume. So density is M divided by V. And remember, density is represented by rho, the little curly P. And mass is 20,160. And we have to divide this by the volume. So we know volume is length by width by height. So we just have to say. 1.4 times 2 times 3. So let's work that out in our calculators. So what we're going to put is 20160, 20, divided by open bracket 1.4 times 2 times 3, close bracket. And what we got there. So what we got there, the density is going to be equal to 2400. And remember, the unit here is going to be kilograms per meter cubed. Mass over volume. And then there's four marks because, again, you have a series of steps. You have, you have something to convert here. That's one mark. You have the formula that's the next mark. The answer is third mark and the unit, which is the fourth mark. Remember, always be very careful when you're looking at units. All right, so let's look at this next one. Define the term pressure. Okay, so this is not hard. So pressure is defined as force acting per unit area. And that is where we get the formula P is F over E. <coughs> okay. Given that G, so we are the third one now, given that G is equal to 10 newtons per kilogram, G is gravity, calculate the pressure exerted on the floor by the base of the concrete block. Okay, so this is where we actually have to use this formula now. P is equal to F over E. But we run into like a little bit of problems now because we need to have a force and an area. So we have to come back to the diagram now. So how are we going to work out the force? What is the force of the block and the block pressing against the ground? 
Well, if the if gravity is acting on the block, the block is pressing against the ground, that is going to be the weight of the block. So what we'd have to do is multiply this mass by 10 to get its weight. W is equal to mg. So we're going to do that just now. The next thing here is what is the area of the block? Well, it's only the bottom of the block is actually pressing against the, the ground. So we need to look at these lower measurements here, not the height. So what we need is the, the width, which is 1.4, and the length, which is 2. So if we know if you multiply 2 by 1.4, well, that's going to give you 2.8. So that's going to be the area. So let's work this out here now. So there's actually two ways to work this out, which I'll, I'll show you all just now. So first we're going to work out what is the force. So the force, so the weight is equal to mg. That's going to be equal to 20160 times g which is 10 and that's going to be 201,600 newtons the next thing we got to work out is the area so that's just going to be the length by the width remember that is going to be 2 times 1.4 what we just worked out 2.8 meters squared so of course they tried to show as much as is working as it could. So we already have our values that we could use to work with these things out. So this is going to be 201,600 divided by what is the area again? Is going to be. Let's work this out. And that's going to be a nice cool 72,000 pascals. So I just said that there's a second way to work this out because there's actually at this level we learned two formulas for, for pressure, right? And oops, sorry. So the second formula for pressure that we learned is rho hg, which would have been density by gravity times height. Density we would have worked out to be 2400 previously. The height of the block is 3 and gravity is 10. So this actually might have been the easier way to go since you already had the, um, the density. So we just had to say 2400 times 10 times 3 if you work this out, you're going to get 2,400 times 24,000 times 3 is 72,000 pascals. And so you have two ways you could work it out. This is the easier way, of course. Given that we already had the density, this would have been kind of the longer way, but either way is valid. Nice. So let's look at question three. Define the term heat capacity and define the term specific latent heat of vaporization. Okay. So first, let's define the term heat capacity. So heat capacity is defined as the amount of heat energy required to change one kilogram, no, sorry, to change a substance or body by a temperature of one Kelvin or one degree Celsius. So what is the difference between that and specific heat capacity? So first heat capacity is like if I have a lake and that lake or if I have a swimming pool, and that swimming pool has a thousand kilograms of water. The heat capacity would be to change all thousand kilograms by one degree. Like if I add enough heat to it, all that water in that pool is going to raise by one degree. 
specific heat capacity, however, is not really used for bodies, like not for body or water. It'll just be used for one kilogram of water. So specific heat capacity would be the same thing, the amount of energy to change, but only one kilogram of water from that pool by a temperature of one Kelvin. So heat capacity would more be used for like large bodies or substances, like if I have a big metal crate, a big iron crate, specific heat capacity would just be for one kilogram of that iron. So that's the, the basic difference between it. And the unit, that the mass for the unit, but the unit will just be joules per Kelvin. And if you think about it, joules is a measurement of energy, the amount of heat energy required to change the temperature of a body by one Kelvin or one degree Celsius, either one. The next one here is define the term specific latent heat or vaporization. Okay, so note the word here, vaporization. We know that immediately that means turning a liquid into a gas vapor. So remember, latent heat is given off. Oh, sorry, latent heat is either given off or absorbed by a substance. And when that happens, the temperature doesn't change. Instead, what happens is that the molecular structure changes because it either breaks bonds or bonds reform. So in the case here, um, to define this specific latent heat of vaporization is defined as the amount of heat energy required to change, or because the specific is per kilogram, right? To change one kilogram of a liquid to a gas without, and if you think about without, or what doesn't happen without a temperature change. So, for example, if I'm boiling a pot of water, it'll be the amount of energy to turn that water from its boiling point, which is 100 degrees Celsius, into steam at 100 degrees Celsius. The temperature doesn't change until all of it has converted to steam. Same way, if, I if it was specifically latent heat of fusion, that would be not liquid to gas, so it would be solid to liquid. So, for example, the amount of energy required to heat one kilogram of ice and convert it to water. The next question here is, a substance which has a freezing point of 80 degrees Celsius was cooled from 90 degrees Celsius to its total solid at its freezing point. Sketch a graph on figure four to represent the statement above. Okay, so this substance was originally 90 degrees Celsius. Then the substance dropped to 80 degrees Celsius where it froze and became a solid. Right? And that is the freezing point is 80. So what would this graph look like? So it looked like a typical cooling curve. So the temperature is gonna drop from 90 to 80, where it's gonna plateau. And we could leave it there, but we can we can drop a little more if you want to the right. But we could right. So what's what's happening here is what we'll do is that we could just label which part is liquid. This part is the liquid here. And this part is the solid. Well, it's not solid yet. It's actually turning from solid to liquid at this point. And down here is going to be a solid. Sorry, I have it reversed. It's going to be liquid to solid here because it's freezing. Let's turn into a solid. Typical cooling curve, where this represents the freezing point. This represents the point at which latent heat of fusion is being given off. So the temperature doesn't change. All that's changing is the state of matter. Next one, a student conducted an experiment in which 1.5 kilograms of water 
at 30 degrees Celsius was converted to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. Assuming no heat is lost to the surroundings, calculate the amount of energy needed to do the following. So heat the water from 30 to 100. Then the next part is to convert the water at 100 Celsius, steam at 100. So this will be a latent heat one because the temperature didn't change, just state a matter. And then the total energy needed to heat it, which is just to be the sum of the final two answers. So we are coming down here to this because we're missing two key points of information. We are missing the specific heat capacity of water and we are missing the latent heat of vaporization of water. So typically now we look at the end of the question and they're going to give us that. And we can see that right here. The specific heat capacity is 4200 joules per kilogram Kelvin and the specific latent heat of vaporization is 2.3 by 10 to the power 6 so 2.3 million joules per Kelvin. I just realized I make a little mistake here. Oh no, I didn't. They did. This is supposed to be um, not joules per Kelvin, this will be joules per kilogram, CXC, I know nothing. That's a bad mistake. Okay. So let's work out the first part. Right, so we, what we're going to say is E is equal to MC delta T, which will be T2 minus T1, the final temperature minus the initial. What is the mass of the water? So let's look at the question. The mass of the water, as we see, is 1.5. What is the specific heat capacity of the water? For well, we would have just seen at the bottom of the paper, would have been 4200. What is the temperature change? So that's going to be the final temperature, which is 100, minus the initial, which is 30, and that's equal to 70. Simple now. Let's work this out. So we're, we're going to have 1.5 times 4200 times the change in temperature, which is 70. We're going to put our answer here, which is 441,000. And what will be our unit? But remember, this is the amount of energy, right? So this is going to be joules. Right, so not joules per kilogram Kelvin because that there is the specific heat capacity. We are just working out energy, how much energy is needed. Right, so let's look at the second part. And let's remember this number here, 441,000. How much energy is needed to convert the water at 100 degrees Celsius to steam at 100 degrees Celsius? So what we need to use is the formula E is the equal to MLV. So we need to remind ourselves of what is the mass. So we know that the mass of water is 1.5. We're going to boil off that 1.5. And this will be how much energy will be needed to boil off that 1.5. So this is going to be E is equal to MLV. What is the mass? It is 1.5. What is the latent heat of vaporization? If you remember, it will be 2.3 million or 2.3 times 10 to the power 6. And that was what was given to us on the bottom. So let's work this out together. So that's going to be 1.5 times 2.3 EXP 6 close bracket. We're going to get a big number here. So we're going to get 3,450,000. This is just energy, so this is going to be joules. So the next question here now is how much energy was needed to heat the water from 30 Celsius to 100 converted to steam at 100? Well, this one is no trick. All you have to do is just add the previous answers. 
So let's remember what the answer was previously. Was four forty one thousand. This was the heat to from thirty to hundred, and this answer down here three million four fifty thousand. This is the amount of eternity to steam. So it's be some of these. Things. So what we're gonna do is the total, and we're gonna say the total energy. Gonna be four forty one thousand plus three million four fifty thousand. You see if you can just add, you can see it's just one mark. Because all it really testing is your knowledge to to know to add the two. So we are gonna get three million eight ninety one thousand joules. And that there's question three. So let's go on to the next one. And I'll just put this up here. This is a reminder. Remember that this year is June 2019, right? So you all could just look on top here to see what you get. Well, actually, you could see it right here with still. Um, before I continue, let me know if everything coming through clearly, you know, like um, the writing and thing is a okay size or... Let me know. And I say is I have it? some background. It okay? Yeah. And I have some background music on here, so um, I don't know if that's too loud. They probably might might need me it so much. Alright, so let's go on to number four. So this one deals with uh, waves, light. Uh, let me just take a look at the question. Alright, so this has a little bit of lenses in it as well. Alright, so for A1, state three features of an image producing a plane mirror. Well, this one is, is, is simple. The feature one is that it's going to be laterally inverted. Basically, it, it flipped, right? But the correct one is laterally inverted. The second feature here is that it's going to be the same height or size as the object. So if it's a plane mirror, the, the image is not going to be any bigger or any smaller than the object. If it has a height of 10 cm, the object, the image is going to have a height of 10 cm. The other feature here is that it's going to be the same distance from the mirror as the object. So if the mirror, if the object is one meter away from the mirror, the image is going to be one meter away. So other answers are just put in the corner here. The image is upright and the image is virtual. Virtual means it cannot be projected onto a screen, as opposed to real images, which can. Right, so to reiterate, three features of an image producing a plane mirror, the image is laterally inverted, same height or size as the object, same distance from the mirrors, yep, easy to remind. Explain why the word police is painted in this manner at the front of some emergency vehicles. So you can see police is laterally inverted, right? And this is not this is not hard. We just had to use the common sense a little bit and use the right terminologies. Police vehicles, police and other emergency vehicles are usually seen approaching from behind the driver. As a result, the words on the front of the vehicles should be laterally inverted due to the driver viewing it, viewing them in the rear view mirror. This facilitates quick recognition 
of the word an appropriate and an appropriate response can be carried out quickly. I don't type like put this much information, but um, it was it. So basically, you, you have a police vehicle or ambulance coming from behind. You know, the, the, the protocol is to pull aside, you know, pull to the side of the road to allow to make way. So you don't know if they, if, if they hear someone um, on the cardiac arrest and they need to reach the hospital immediately or they have a severe wound. We don't know, but the, the point is that, you know, you have to make way. And a lot of people, but you know, they don't, they don't recognize the words. I don't know if that's true, but in order to quickly recognize the words, um, they will see it as police, you know, not not like how you see it here, like 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 flipped properly, and the person will be able to uh, to have a jerk reaction and you know, match brakes and pull to the side of the road. But the key word you want to have here is laterally inverted. And that the that the fact that the driver is watching it in a mirror, um, whether it's the side mirror or the rear view, and that they have to quickly recognize the word. That's basically where three marks is. Okay. B figure five shows an incomplete ray diagram. Complete, so here this is a concave lens, by the way. Concave or diverging lens. Complete the ray diagram to show the part of the emerging ray after it passes through the lens. Okay, so what basically you have to do is so remember how this would be is that I'm gonna paste this here. So how this would be. So a convex lens is actually gonna convert is, is gonna converge the lines through um this focal point here. So for example, convex lens, the rays would look like this. Right? So they're all converging at a point. But a concave lens, we know that it diverges like this. So but how do we draw that properly? Right? So we know that it spreads out. It's kind of like a flashlight. Well, it's actually pretty easy. All we have to do is draw it from this focal point here. So we're going to draw this line from a straight line going across the optical center, the lens of the line. So that's it there. So that's how it's completed. Right? So, so you can't just draw like a random line going like that, for example. Right? It has to come from this point F and come through there. Same thing if you had a if you had a ray like this here. Right? You wanted to draw it however diverge. Same thing here. Like that. Okay, so I'm gonna draw that here. So this uh this don't have ruler Things and I got to draw it with my hand, which, which as you can see, not from an orbit at all. Yeah. So I'll just try my best. I'll erase whatever, yes. That I got to do. Okay. And typically, this would be like a dotted line here because it's imaginary. On the diagram, label the focal length, F, comma, F. Okay, so the focal length is going to be the distance between the focal point, either focal point, and the optical center of the lens, which is right in the middle here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to label. I'm going to draw a line like this here. Right, and it'll be this distance I see. Right, and this is going to be your focal length. Right, so it's basically the distance between this point and this point. 
the center of the lens. It's called the optical center. Okay, let's look at this one. An object AB was placed 15 centimeters in front of a converging lens. So this has nothing to do with the diagram above, right? A focal length 5 cm. So the object was placed 15 centimeters in front of a converging lens and the focal length is 5 centimeters. So the question here is now calculate the image distance. Okay. So the formula for working on focal length, which you're going to have to transpose, is 1 over f is equal to 1 over um, do, or I'll, I'm going to put is u plus 1 over u plus 1 over v. But u is the object distance. Sometimes I can call it do, object distance, or distance of object, plus 1 over v. V or DI is the image distance. So this is, we want to find for 1 over V. So we're going to transpose this. We're going to make 1 over V the subject. And so basically, this will be 1 over F. Right? Minus 1 over U. So let's look at the, 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 let's replace these with figures now. So one over F. So what is F? So F is the focal length and the focal length is five centimeters. And the object distance, which is U, is gonna be 15 centimeters. So let's work this out here. One over five minus one over 15. So how do you work this out? Well, we just have to use a, a LCM, like when we subtract in fractions. So what is the lowest common multiple of five and 15? Well, the number that, the lowest number that both of these could go into is 15. Remember it's multiples, right? Not factors. How many times can five go into 15? That'll be three. And how many times can 15 go into 15? Well, that'll be one. Uh, and we'll get two over 15. So, you might say now, well, is that our answer? So no, that is not our answer because one over V is equal to two over 15. So what would V be? So therefore, the three dots, V is equal to 15 over 2. If you divide that, that will be 7.5. And you put the unit, which will be centimeters. So let me just reiterate quickly what we did. The question is asking us to calculate the image distance. So this is the formula, this is the lens formula. One over F, where F is the focal length, is equal to one over U, which is the object distance, plus one over V, which is the image distance. We need to rearrange this formula to find for V. So one over V, is equal to 1 over f, and you put the 1 over u over here. So 1 over f minus 1 over u. We work it out like fractions. f is 5, u is 15. The LCM is 15. 5 into 15 is 3. 15 into 15 is 1. There might be minus n in this case because that's how the how this whole range formula. 3 minus 1 is 2 over 15. The last step is because we need to invert it because that is 1 over v. We want for this v, the image distance. So that'll be v is 15 over 2, which is the inverse, 7.5. Is 
It's a lot of work for three marks, but that's what it is. Our next question is calculate the magnification of the image forms. All right, so the magnification to calculate that. So there's two formulas you could, you could use. You can use height of image over height of an object or distance of image over distance of object. So I'm going to use distance because that's what we have. Typically, you could write this as di over do or v over u. So what is the image distance? We would have just worked it out as 7.5. What is the object distance? The object distance was 15. Remember, always look back at the, the, the previous question to answer it. So the image distance is 0, 7.5. The object distance is. So what is the magnification? If you work it out in a calculator, that is going to be 0 0.5. So you don't need to put a unit for this because it just shows that the image is only 0.5 times as big as the object. You can put a little X if you want. It's not necessary, but don't put things like centimeters and things like that. So exactly, get a mark for not putting the unit. Okay. Next one here. A semiconductor diode is used in a half wave rectification. Using the axes on figure six, sketch the IV graph as a current voltage graph for the semiconductor diode. Okay. So if you remember what a semiconductor diode does is that it converts an alternating current into a direct current. So it does this by by stopping the, the reverse flow of current, right? So it only allows one way flow of current through a circuit. So how this would work? So typically, a typical voltage current graph would look like this, where it goes into both the positive region and the negative region of the graph. This shows it flowing forward. This shows it flowing backward. So we're going to have something like this, but we're not going to have the backward part. Because what the diode does, it only allows it to flow in one way. So our graph is going to look something like this. Right? And then here is going to be right below a flat line. So not on the x-axis itself, but right below it. And that is our graph. This is for the diode. And it shows that current will flow in one way, but there's no flow in the other way. Right, so the next question is complete the truth table shown in table three for a NAND gate. All right, so a, just to briefly go through this, right? We have um, at this level you would you would learn five types of gates: a NOT gate, an OR gate, an AND gate, a NAND gate, which is just a NOT gate and an AND gate combined. NAND means not AND and a NOR gate, which is just the combination of a NOT gate and an OR gate. NOR means not OR. So, just to go through it here quickly. So this is a, this would be an AND gate, right? And let's say I have a one and a one here. But what an AND gate does is that both inputs have to be positive in order to get a positive um, output. So both of them have to be one. Kind of like you need for you to log into something, you, you need a username and your password, right? So this would be a one. So this is like you have a username and your password. What if you have a username and you don't have a password? So that'll be a zero. Well, you wouldn't get to log in, so this would be a zero. What if you have your your password, but not a username. Well, again, you wouldn't get to log in, so this would be a zero. So that's an AND gate, right? 
Well, of course, if you don't have a username and a password, you don't get to log in. So, an AND gate, right? A one and a one gives you a one. A one and a zero gives you a zero. A zero and a one gives you a zero. And of course, a zero and a zero gives you a zero. So what about a NAND gate? So a NAND gate now is the opposite of an AND gate. So what would give you a zero for an AND gate would give you a one, and what would give you a one would give you a zero. So typically you'd know it by having this little circle in the front. So how do we how do we work this out? Well, easy. You think about an AND gate and then you do the opposite. One and a one and an AND gate would usually give you a one. Now we'll give you a zero. A one and a zero would usually give you a zero. Now we'll give you a one. A zero and a one would usually give you a zero. Now we'll give you a one. And a zero and a zero would usually give you a zero. But now we'll give you a one. You do the same thing for an OR gate and a NOR gate. You just have to do the opposite. So let's look back at the question here. Complete the truth table in table three for NAND gate. So let's go through it again. So a zero and a zero would usually give you, let me talk about an AND gate first. So a zero and a zero would usually give you a zero. That's for AND gate. That's like if it don't have a username and a password. But for a NAND gate, it'll do the opposite. So this would be a one. Zero and a one would usually give you a zero. But a NAND gate where you have to do the opposite will give you a one. One and a zero would usually give you a zero for an AND gate. But the opposite would be for a NAND. One and a one for an AND gate, if you have a username and your password, you typically get to log in. So this would usually give you a one. But for a NAND gate, this would give you a zero. Logic gates are basically systems of transistors that are used to perform complex operations like algorithms in search engines, um, burglar alarms, um, thermostats, or anything that regulates something would use logic gates in it. You don't have to get into that much at this level, but they do form very complex systems that we use every day, like on our phones and laptops and things like that. All right, so let's look at C. Figure seven shows three resistors in series of values two ohms, five ohms, and 10 ohms. Calculate the equivalent resistance of the resistors shown in figure seven. Well, these are in series, so all you have to do is just add them. RS is equal to R1 plus R2 plus R3. RS means resistors in series, right? 2 plus 5 plus 10. Our answer is going to be, and you probably don't need a calculator for this, the answer is going to be 17 ohms. The next question is, we have two resistors that are placed in parallel as shown in figure eight, and we have a two ohm, a five ohm, and a 10 ohm. Calculate the equivalent resistance of the resistors in figure eight. Okay, so we know we can just add them, and we can say two and five and 10 is 17 like before. So what we have to do now is say one over R P, that means resistors in parallel, and that's going to be equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. So this will be 1 over 2 plus 1 over 5 plus 
1 over 10. And we work it out uh, doing LCM, like how we did the lens question. So, what is the LCM of 2, 5, and 10? And that will be 10. How many times can 2 go into 10? That will be 5. How many times can 5 go into 10? That will be 2. And how many times can 10 go into 10? So that will be 1. Now we just have to add 5 plus 2 is 7 plus 1 is 8. And once again, the mistake would be to stop here. Because this doesn't represent the resistance. This represents 1 over the resistance. So if 1 over RP is equal to 8 over 10, RP will be equal to 10 over 8. And let's work that in the calculators. 10 divided by 8. And you get a nice cool answer here. Your answer is going to be 1.2 five ohms. So let's look at the question below now. The resistors in figure eight were connected in a circuit to a six volt power supply. Calculate the total current flowing through the circuit. Well, this is easy. All we have to use is use the formula for Ohm's law. So if you remember, the formula for Ohm's law says that V is equal to I R. So we're going to have to rearrange this to find for I. So let's work this out here. So we're going to say V is equal to I R. Therefore, I is equal to V over R. What is the voltage? The voltage that they said the supply is, is 6. What is the resistance? Well, that would have been what we just worked out. And that would have been 1.25. So let's work that out. 6 divided by 1.25. What is that equal to? So that's equal to 4.8. And remember to put a unit is current. So it'll be 4.8 amperes. And that there's question five. Okay, so I will still go through the atomic physics questions because when you all have to review, not just for mock exams, but for CXC, um, you could, you know, just find the whole paper here. Let's look at the question. It's not too long. So I'll go through it here. This one, Lord, you won't let us solve it. Okay, lithium-7 is an isotope of lithium. The mass number is 7 and the atomic number is 3. Use the information given above to determine the number of protons and neutrons present in an atom of lithium-7. So that's not hard at all. Um, so if they say the mass number is 7, but the atomic number is 3. Well, that the atomic, that means it has three protons. And the number of neutrons is going to be everything else. So it's going to be seven minus three, which is four. Not bad. All right, so the next question here is now is draw a labeled diagram of the structure of lithium seven. And this here is 4 max. So this is just drawing like an atomic structure of it, right? 
and we're going to assume that it's electrically neutral, so the same number of neutrons, uh, sorry, same number of um, protons is going to be equal to the number of electrons. So we just said that there are three protons, right? So that means that there will be three electrons. So we're going to draw, this is our nucleus. And our nucleus is going to have three, typically a label was in the nucleus, right? Three protons, four neutrons, they just write it like that. Around here, we're going to have our first shell. And if you remember from chemistry, how many electrons fit in the first shell is just two. So it's going to be one electron here, the second electron here, and the third electron is going to go in this shell here. And although you don't need it for this question, we know that the number of electrons that fits in the second shell is eight, and the third shell is eight. Right, so I know it don't look too good, but yeah, so this, this is what it is, and so now we just label it. So this here is, this is an electron. This here is a shell. And this at the bottom here is the nucleus. Easy. As it is, it's stuff you're supposed to know already. All right, so the next question is, in four days, the activity of a sample of lithium decreases to one sixteenth of its original activity. Okay, so one sixteenth of its original activity is so one over sixteen. And that happened in four days. All right, so the first question here is define the term half life. Okay. Half life is defined as the time taken for a radioactive, sorry, radioactive substance to decay by half, which means it could drop to half its activity or the mass could decrease by half. So the next question here is assuming to figure out the half-life. Calculate the half-life of lithium. Okay, so they said in four days, the activity dropped to one sixteenth its original activity. Right, so let me just type this here so you remember. In four days, activity dropped to one sixteenth its initial value, right? So how do we calculate the half-life based on this? Well, what we have to do is calculate how many half-lives would have passed um, to drop to 116. So once again, we start with one, and then we each, each half-life, it drops by half. So it, it decreases by half. So the first half-life will be a half, after a second half life is going to be water. After a third half life is going to be one eighth. And after a fourth half life is going to be one sixteenth. So if you look here, how many half lives passed? It would have been you count the number of arrows one, two, three, four. So four half lives, and this uh, this took four days, right? So four half lives took four days. So how much would be one half life? Well, this is easy. One half life would just be um, four days over four, and that would be equal to one day. That's the answer. So just to reiterate what I did, you just have to calculate how many half lives would have passed for it to drop to one sixteenth its value. So, for example, if the answer, if, if, if it was one eighth, this probably would have only been one, two, three half lives. One sixteenth would be one, two, three, four half lives. They say that this took four days to occur. The whole thing took four days to occur. So, this would have been one day, one day, one day, one day. All right, let's look at this question here. 
calculate the energy given off in a nuclear reaction if the change in mass, as delta M, is 0.2014U. And one unit U is 1.66 times 10 to the power negative 27 kilograms. C is equal to 3 by 10 to the power 8. Well, we have to use the formula. Delta E is equal to delta MC squared. And this is just using the formula to work it out. There's no big thing to do. It's just that the numbers is going to be a little, you know, they're going to be a little difficult. So what is the change in mass? It's going to be 0 0.2014, but we're going to convert that to kilograms. So we're going to multiply that by 1.66 times 10 to the power negative 27. Multiplied by C squared. So C is 3 by 10 to the power 8. So we could just put in c squared one time. So 3 squared is 9. And 10 to the power 8 squared is 10 to the power 16. So let's work it out together. If you have a calculator, put open brackets. 0 0.2014 multiplied by 1.66 exp negative 27 close brackets times open bracket 9 exp 16 close bracket equal so if you did it correctly you're gonna get 3.008916 times 10 to the power of negative 11. And what will be your unit is energy, so your unit is joules. So remember for, for the, the atomic physics parts, um, if we can have questions like these, you don't round off, you put all the decimals because all of these, this is on atomic level. All of the numbers involved are very small and very precise. So um, don't round it to after this tree put all the, the decimals. And that there is June 2019. So we're going to go through June 2018 now. The one that we did last time was June 2019. Um, I'm not going to go through the first quest because as, as looking at uh, what I'll do is that if anybody attempted to get in trouble with it, I'll probably just do it and send it because um, this will take me too long to do. And I'll actually need to draw the graph because you actually have to mark off parts on the graph. It's looking like a tougher one, but I could always just do it and send it. So I'm actually going to start from question two. And this is our next. Um, atomic physics one so this it shouldn't take too long so I'll, I'll do it so let me read and remember this is june 2018 right? you can look on top here to see here. an atom consists of three types of particles protons neutrons and electrons complete the following table to show the charge of each particle Okay, so this is easy. The charge of a proton is plus one or positive. The charge of a neutron is zero or neutral. And the charge of an electron is negative one or just negative, right? But plus one, zero, and negative one. Okay. For the element 226 radium, radium 226, which is atomic number 88. And I want to write this a little bigger here. Right, radium 226. Determine the number of each of the three particles referred to in A1. Okay, so this one is not hard at all. So the atomic number is 88. So that's also the number of protons, which is 88.
the number of neutrons. Okay, so how do we calculate the number of neutrons? So that's going to be the difference between the mass number and the atomic number. So that's going to be 226 minus 88. And if we work that out, that's going to be 138 neutrons. And actually, this would show that radium here is unstable or radioactive because the number of protons and neutrons are far from being a one-to-one -one ratio. The number of electrons, so assuming that is neutral, is, is a it doesn't have a charge, a neutrally charged one, the number of electrons is going to be equal to the number of protons. So that's also going to be 88. Right? Number of protons equals the number of electrons. All right, so the next question here is, state one similarity and one difference between the isotopes of an element. All right, so remember isotopes are the same type of element. They have the same atomic number, but different mass numbers. So similarity is that they have the same atomic number or same number of protons, but the difference is that they will have different mass numbers or different number of neutrons. So just, just to give you a quick example, if I have two elements, U-235, uranium-235, with an atomic number 92, the ice and isotope of that is uranium 238 and what that means is that it has three extra neutrons in it than the first one and a simpler one would be carbon 12 and carbon 13 carbon 13 has one extra neutron in it those are isotopes define the term half-life we did that just before so let's put it again here. Right, half-life is the time taken to for a radioactive substance by half. So if the half-life is two days, it, it will take two days to drop to half its mass or half its activity. If it's a year, it'll take a year to drop to half and so on. The element thorium has a half-life of 24 days and undergoes beta decay. Calculate the time it would take for 10 grams of thorium to decay to 1.25 grams. Again, not hard to do. What we have to think about here is what number we're going to start with. Well, we started with 10 grams. So we start with 10 and after one half-life, how much would be left? It'll be half of 10. That'll be 5. After uh, my next half life, how long, how much would we have left after? Which is half of 5, which is 0.5. And after one other half life, we're going to have half of 2.5 left, which is 1.25. We could stop there because they say how long will it take from 10 to 1.25. The next thing we have to do now is count how many half-lives occurred. And you count the arrows. One, two, three. And they said the element thorium has a half-life of 24 days. So they already gave it the half-life. You don't to forget how they already gave it to you. And they said the time it would take. So each arrow represents 24 days. So the time taken is going to be the half-life times the number of half-lives. So was the half-life of thorium? 24 days. How many half-lives occurred? One, two, three. The answer here is gonna be 72 days. All 
and has it for the atomic physics question. So let's look at this one here. All right, let's give me a minute here. So the question says, define what is an electric field. So if you remember from e electromagnetism, electric fields are also found where you have magnetic fields, right? And basically the electric field, you can think of it as it is a region um, around an object that is charged and where a force would, would a, a force would enact on that object. So for example, if an electron was to pass through an electric field, it might get repelled. Right? So if some kind of particle passes through it, 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 it would it a force would act on it either to attract it or repel it. So remember an electric field is is electrons, right? So is a is a current. So how do we define this for three marks? Right, so this is an electric field. Is a region surrounding a charged particle or object, which a force be exerted on other charged particles, or objects. So, if you have a, if you have an electric field, like you have a field of electrons and uh, a proton was to go into it, that proton would be swayed due to the, the attraction or repulsion of the particles. All right, so the question here is now draw the electric field between the parallel plates shown in figure three. Well, if we use in conventional current, we know that current always flows from positive to negative. So when we draw in the electric fields here, it's it pretty easy. We just had to draw arrows going from positive to negative, kind of like for a magnet to draw it going from north to south. If it's north to south, you'd more say magnetic field. Electric field, you'd more say positive or negative. So you just need to draw four arrows going across here. Okay. The next question here is a lightning strike is an example of an electrostatic hazard. State one other hazard of static charge and state one useful application of static charge. Okay. They just had a state one. So one hazard of static charge is our electrical fire. Or a short or a electrical shortage, electrical short circuit. Um, you also have electrocution, like of a person if they if, if you have exposed wires. Okay, this other list one, the, the easiest one is an electrical fire. State one useful application of static charge. So you have plenty of uses um, for static electricity. Um, one of them would be electrostatic painting. Like when they painting cars, they charge the metal negatively and they charge the paint positively. It allows the paint to stick to the car. Electroplating. Um, photocopying machines and printers, all these use static charge so that the ink could stick to the paper. I think e electrolysis could work too. So any, any one of those, gamma. Okay, so here we have a graph and they say the graph in figure four shows the alternating voltage output from your generator. And we could see here that it goes up to 10 volts, that's the peak, and the lowest dip 
or the trough goes down to minus 10. So you can see the amplitude of this is 10. So if we look here now and we was to take one wave, one wave is eight milliseconds. So remember the time here is in milliseconds, right? Milliseconds. So one wave is eight, the period of it is eight milliseconds. It takes eight milliseconds to complete one oscillation, one crest and one trough, right? So you can see as eight. One crest, one trough in eight milliseconds. All right, so let's let's um look at the questions now. Using the graph in figure four, determine the value of the peak to peak voltage. All right, so this, this is easy. This is just the the top the 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 um the highest point of the graph is ten volts. So the value of the peak voltage is ten. Calculate, determine the period of the alternating voltage in seconds. Okay, so remember the period here is the time taken for one oscillation. And that would have been eight milliseconds. So we need to put that in seconds. And let's work this out here. So the period, which is capital T, is eight milliseconds. So in seconds, that will be eight divided by a thousand, and that's gonna be 0 0.008 seconds. Calculate the frequency of the alternating voltage from the supply. Okay, so if you remember now how to calculate frequency, if we have the period, it'll be very easy to work out because all we have to say, and let's see if you can remember the formula, the formula for frequency is going to be equal to 1 over the period, T. So this is not going to be hard. We just have to say 1 over 0. Point zero zero eight. So you have to remember that it had to be in seconds, right? So not milliseconds. So this would be one using the calculators, one divided by zero point zero zero eight. So let's put our answer now. So our answer is gonna be one twenty-five. And now we need to put the unit, so it's frequency. So our unit is going to be hertz. Or 125 S minus one per second, waves per second. All right, so let's look at question four. So we did um, we did something like this already, so let's play it back. Define each of the following terms, specific heat capacity. This is the amount of heat energy required to change the temperature of one kilogram, because it's specific heat capacity, right? Of a substance by one Kelvin. So once again, this is only if you're dealing with a specifically one kilogram of a substance. Heat capacity. This is the amount of heat energy, and you remember it's very similar to the other one, but we just remove in one part. Heat energy required to change the temperature of a substance or body by one Kelvin. So what was the front? In this case here, the temperature is not the temperature of one kilogram. It's just of a body or a substance. And just remember the units. But it's um, specific heat capacity is joules per kilogram Kelvin 
and for heat capacity is joules per Kelvin, not per kilogram. All right, the next one, write the formula to show the relationship between the specific heat capacity common C and heat capacity capital C of a body. Easy. The heat capacity, which is capital C, is equal to mass times specific heat capacity. Basically, the specific heat capacity, which is per kilogram, times the number of kilograms in the body. Whether it's a body of water, a body of metal, or whatever. Right, so capital C is equal to M by common C. Okay. Some students were asked to carry out an experiment to determine the specific heat capacity of a metal. They use the apparatus shown in figure five. And this is figure five. And what can you see in this? We have a thermometer to measure temperature. We have a voltmeter to measure voltage. We have an ammeter to measure current. And we supposed to also have a stopwatch here to measure time. So we know that the formula for specific heat capacity is E is equal to M C delta T. But we also know so that energy is equal to power by time. Or we could even simplify it to power is IV, so energy is equal to current by voltage by time. So let's look at the readings below. So they said the switch was closed for a time interval of 900 seconds. So there we have our time. And the following readings were obtained. We have the mass of the block. We have our change in temperature. We have our current. And we have our voltage. So we have a lot of stuff here already. And so we have everything to work out both the energy and the specific heat capacity. So let's work this out here. So they say using the data on page 14, calculate the specific heat capacity of the metal, stating any assumptions made. Okay. So we're going to say, first we're going to calculate how much energy went into this block. So we're going to say E is equal to power by time, which will be current by volts by time. So what was the current? Let's look. Let, let's look for the current and the voltage and the time. So the current would be the ammeter reading, which is 8.5. The voltage is 12. And the time is 900. So you could multiply that. 8.5 by 12 by 900. Let's see what we get. 8.5 times 12 times 900. And that'll be 91,800 joules. So this is not our answer, but this will help us determine the next part of the question. So the next part is asking us, what is the specific heat capacity? So we're gonna have to use this formula, E is equal to MC um, delta T. That's for change in T. So we need to rearrange this to find for C. Let me do this on the side here. So remember E is equal to M C delta T. So what we need to do, we need to find what is C. That's going to calculate this. So remember, C stays here, C stays home, and M and delta T go next door where they go downstairs. 
So C would be equal to E and the others downstairs over M delta T. Right? So let's 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 put this here. So C is equal to E over M times delta T. So the values for this, what is E? So we just worked that out. That is 91,800. And let's find over the mass again. And the change in temperature. So the mass is 5 kilograms. And the change in temperature is 50 Celsius. This will be 5 times 50. In your calculators, you're going to put 91,800 divided by open bracket 5 times 50 close bracket. And what you're going to get here is 367.8. Now we need to put our unit. So this is going to be joules, the energy is in joules, per kilogram as in mass, Kelvin or degree Celsius, whichever one, for the temperature. And that is your answer. Now the question also said, state any assumptions made. So from this, we could state our two assumptions. What we're going to have to assume is that we're going to have to assume here that none of the heat was lost to the atmosphere or none of the heat was lost to the surface or the, the, the surface that the block was sitting on or to the wires. So all of this here we have to assume. So we could see that there's insulation, so there's probably no heat, very little heat loss by conduction, but that didn't really prevent um, heat loss by radiation and things like that. So what are we going to have to assume? We just have to apply two. One. There was no, there's minimal to no heat loss in the wires. And there was minimal to no heat loss due to radiation and conduction. The insulation. Now, in reality, of course, those things would occur, which is why you know the the answer they get wouldn't be um, one hundred percent accurate, because you always have heat loss of the atmosphere and through wires and things like that. What the person could do is that they could make sure to use um, low resistance wires or wires that are thicker to minimize heat loss. And this was a stunning nine marks, because, but you could see that there was a lot of steps to doing it. OK, so let's look at question five. So five A1 state hooks law. And then two, with the aid of a label sketch graph, explain what is meant by the elastic limit. Okay. So if you remember, Hooke's law deals with springs, and it says that the extension of a spring is directly proportional to the load acting on it. So for example, if I add a five Newton weight and it extends by one centimeter, if I add a 10 Newton weight, it should extend by two centimeters and so on. So Hooke's law states that the load on a spring is directly proportional to its extension given that it is within its elastic limit. So the elastic limit of a spring is where the spring begins to fracture and the spring no longer obeys Hooke's law. This is when you have excessive force on a spring. 
and it cannot return to its original state. So I'm sure everybody here stretch a spring so much that the spring it break. Um, it can't return to it, it just remains stretched out. So that once once you pass the elastic limit, that's what happens. So with the aid of a label sketch graph, explain what is meant by elastic limit. And that is three marks. So this is just a sketchy shape. So I'm just going to draw something kind of basic here. Right, so in this case here, we're going to have um, force versus extension. You can have an X or E here. And at first, it's going to be directly proportional. Right, but eventually with the the more force you keep adding, the is not going to extend any further. It's going to fractal. I actually, actually could draw this one. Right, so more look like. Hold on, eh? That looking so clearly. Right, so more, it'll look something like this. And uh, this here, this point, this is the elastic limit where it stops being proportional. This point here is where they are still, uh, um, there's still proportionality. And just to explain what is meant by it. Elastic limit is the point where the extension of the spring is no longer proportional to the load attached to it. The spring cannot return. The spring is permanently deformed and cannot return to its initial length or initial state, right? Get overstretched. Right, let's look at the next question. A steel spring has a spring constant of two by 10, 10 squared Newton. So that's two by 100, 200. Newton per meter. Calculate the weight of an object which when attached to the unloaded spring produces an extension of 50 millimeters. So we have to note here that this is millimeters, but this is meters. So this is how to convert. The elastic limit is not exceeded. Okay, so first we're going to convert the extension is going to be 50 millimeters divided by millimeters are thousands, so divide by a thousand. And that's going to be 0 0.05 meters. So to work this out, we're going to have to say to ask what would be the weight. So that's the force. F is equal to Kx. K is the spring constant. Spring constant is 2 or well, 2 by 10 to the power 2 and the extension is 0 0.05 meters so let's work that out so the force needed is just going to be 10 newtons All right so i explain what I did here again so they already gave you the formula and really what it give you here is spring constant, which is K, is equal to force, which is F, over extension, which is X or E. And if you know, if you rearrange this, F is equal to KX here. You multiply both sides by X, F equals KX. However, the extension that they gave you was in millimeters, uh, not meters, but they had this in newtons per meter, so they had to convert. 
So this one did here, 15 millimeters divided by 1,000 is 0 0.05 meters. F equals Kx 200 by 2, 0.05 is equal to 10 newtons. Right, so K is 200 and X is 0 0.05. Is funny how does five marks, but that's what it is. Right, let's look at this question here. The object attached to the spring in B fell from rest and hit the ground after two seconds. Calculate the velocity of the object on hitting the ground. And they give it G is 10. All right, so this question could, uh, it could look a little tricky and let me look at it again. The object attached to the spring in B fell from rest, so it fell from zero meters per second and hit the ground after Um, I think the thing cut off for a little bit time if I, if I come in through again. Yes, sir. All right, cool. So we have to remember what G stands for here. So G is acceleration due to gravity. So G is acceleration. And how long did this accelerate for the object fell? and hit the ground after two seconds. So it accelerated for two seconds. And at what rate did it accelerate? 10 meters per second squared. So we are gonna say, we're gonna use this formula. A is equal to change in velocity. A, A meaning the acceleration over time. So that means that the change in velocity is going to be equal to acceleration by time. So what was the accelerator? Accelerated due to gravity, right? So which is 10. And for how long did it accelerate due to gravity? How long was it falling? Two seconds. And 10 by 2 is 20. And the unit for velocity is, of course, meters per second. So it, it looks a lot more complicated than it is. But remember that this is acceleration, 10 meters per second squared. So every second, it increased by 10 meters per second. And it accelerated for two seconds. So after the first second, it was 10 meters per second. After the second second, it was 20. Okay, and let's look at question six. And question six is a transformer question. So this one is similar to the one we did before. You just had to label some stuff. So the city transformer is a commonplace technological tool used in our daily lives. Figure six shows one type of transformer using electricity distribution. State the name of the parts labeled A, B, C, and D in figure six. Okay, so we'll see here that A is pointing to these coils, B is pointing to the core, D is pointing to these coils here, and C is pointing to the power supply. And remember what type of power supply it has is an AC power supply. So let's label these things here. So A is pointing to the primary coils, B is pointing to the iron core that has to electromagnetize when current is running through it. C is pointing to the power source and it is an AC power source. And D is pointing to not the prime, this is the primary coil and this is the secondary coil. Now looking at this transformer here, we could tell that it is a step up transformer because there's more turns on the secondary coil. When there's more turns, that means that there'll be a higher voltage on this side. Lower current, but higher voltage. Identify the type of transformer shown in figure six. So I just said this is a step up transformer. 
step down would be the reverse when there's less on the secondary side. Right, so the next question is state the formula that relates voltage V to the number of turns N in a transformer. Okay, so the formula for that is given as this. N P, that is the number of primary turns, over N S, that is the number of secondary turns, is equal to V P, that is the primary voltage, over V S, that is the secondary voltage. You could also write this formula as NP over VP is equal to NS over VS. So you get the same answer. Right? So basically, primary turns over secondary is equal to primary voltage over secondary. Okay. A transformer has 5,000 turns in its secondary coil and 50 turns in its primary coil. The voltage supplied to its primary coil is 12 volts. And a current of 6 amps flows into its primary coil. Ooh, that's a lot of pack, right? But we don't need to have to work out everything at once. So I'm going to type here all this information on the side. So the secondary coil, number of secondary turns is 5,000. And the number of primary turns is 50. So we're just unpacking everything here. The primary voltage is 12 volts. And the, and the primary current is six amps. We have this here just to use as a reference. So the first question is this, calculate the input power of the transformer, where power is just current by voltage, and input means the primary. So we just had to say P is equal to IV. And what is the primary current of this? The primary current is going to be Six. And what is the secondary voltage of this transformer? Secondary voltage is going to be 12. So let's multiply that. 12 times 6. And your power here is going to be 72. And then you put a unit, which is watts. All right, so the next one here is calculate the voltage across the secondary coil. All right, so we have all the information here. So how are we going to calculate the voltage across the secondary coil? So we can't, we have to use a, the transformer formula with the number of turns. So if you see here, the number of secondary turns is 5,000 and the number of primary turns is 50. So you could do this in your head, by the way. You could see how much times 50 could go into 5,000. And that'll be 1,000. No, that'll be, that'll be 100. And that means that the voltage is going to be 100 times more on that side. Right? Which will be 1,200. But let's work it out using the formula. So we're going to say NP over NS. is equal to VP over VS. And let's just plug in the numbers now. So NP is 50. That's the number of primary turns. And NS is 5,000 number of secondary turns. VP is the primary voltage, and that's going to be 12 volts. And VS is going to be secondary voltage, which is our unknown. So maybe I will 
what do we do now? Well, what we're doing now is we're going to cross multiply. So we're going to say 50 times VS is equal to 5,000 times 12. So we're going to say 50 VS is equal to 5,000 times 12. So 50 VS is going to be So let's multiply 5,000 times 12, and that will be 60,000. So what would VS be? So if 50 VS is equal to 60,000, VS will be 60,000 divided by 50. And that will be 1,200 volts. Right, so as I said, you could, you could even work it out in your head because the turns ratio of um, the of the coils would be 5,000 over 50, which is 100. What that means is that the voltage is going to be stepped up 100 times. So if the voltage was 1 volt, it will be 100 volts on the secondary side. If the primary voltage was 12 volts as shown here, It'll be a hundred times more, which is twelve hundred. Right. So the next part here is calculate the maximum secondary current if the transformer is a hundred percent efficient, basically no power losses. So the formula that we use for this is I PVP, basically the primary power or input power is equal to ISVS or secondary power. Uh, what they're asking us for is this, the secondary current. So once again, let's see what is the primary current again. So the primary current, they said is six amps, six amps, move this down here. Right, so IP is going to be 6, and VP, the primary voltage, is going to be 12. The secondary current is what we want to find, so we're going to leave that as IS. The secondary voltage is what we just worked out, 1200. So now we say 6 by 12, and 6 by 12 is going to be... 72 is equal to 1200 IS. So all we have to do now is just work out what is IS. IS is going to be 72 divided by 1200. And if you work out, you'll get 0 0.06 amperes. And let's check and mark everything. Yeah. So, Ramba said that the voltage would be stepped up 100 times. This is why 12 would become 1200. But the current would be stepped down a hundred times because they have to trade voltage for current. So this is why if it multiply this by 100, 1200, you'd have to divide this by 100. So 6 divided by 100 is 0 0.06. You still use the formula, but it, it does always work it out quickly in your head. If you know the turns ratio, dividing the, the number of turns, 5050 is 100, you can work out the voltage and the current, secondary voltage and current very quickly. And that is June 2018. Okay, we're back here and we're going to look at June 2017. And the first question deals with a graph and you have to actually mark off things on the graph. Once again, I'm, I'm not going to spend the time doing it, but if you want me to go through it or something, I could do it and send it to you. 
So I'm not gonna do the, the graph parts of it, but I'm gonna do the um I'm gonna start with one C. Remember this is June 2017. Alright, so let me zoom up a little bit. Okay. So June 2017. Question one, part C. Kevin, a physics student, conducted an experiment to determine the effects of electromagnetic induction. He used the following apparatus. So he had a coil of fine wires, which is called a solenoid, a sensitive galvanometer, connecting wires, and a bar magnet. And here you can see the setup. The galvanometer, what that does is that it measures the direction of the current passing, right? The direction of the electrons. So, we know that the north pole is the positive end of the magnet and the south pole is the negative end and that the magnetic field travels from north to south. So does the electric field. So they said now the magnet is pushed into the coil, right, with the north pole facing this, entering this. Draw on figure one the direction of the induced current and the direction of the arrow on the galvanometer as a result of this motion. Okay, so pushing this magnet into this um, coil here, into the solenoid, that is going to cause the electrons to move in this direction. Right? And so where you're going to see the arrow pointing on the galvanometer, it is going to be pointing to the left. All you have to do is trace the pathway of this. And that is the answer here. So that's two maps. Right, so where I drew these arrows, this is going to be the induced current. And inside here, that's the direction of the galvanometer. So the next question here is explain why an induced current is proposed. Now, remember, electromagnetism, that very word says that the electrical field around a charged object, right, um, is cohesive with or is, is what I could say, whenever there's an electric field, there's also a magnetic field. That magnetic field is actually perpendicular to the electric field. So when they say explain why induced current is produced, this is what you're going to say. By moving the magnet into the coil, the thrust or force is created by the magnetic field. That pushes the electrons along the wire. Right? So if you if you can remember Fleming's left hand rule, right? You would have your whenever there's two, whenever there's a force and a magnetic field, there's gonna be a current. Same thing if you have a current and a magnetic field, there's gonna be a force. When you have two out of the three, there's gonna be the third one. Why is it necessary to use a sensitive galvanometer? This is to detect, so remember sensitive means it has to be able to detect small changes. So, so this is to detect small changes in the direction of current. And respond quickly. Changes. So when something is sensitive, like, um, so for example, uh, um, a normal thermometer is not very sensitive. It takes a long time to change the temperature. That's like a lab thermometer, but a thermocouple is very sensitive. A small change in, in temperature is, is going to show up very quickly. Kind of like them temperature guns when you go to the grocery or you go in school or anything. It, it shows changes very quickly in readings. Okay, so the next question is this. The magnet is then pulled out of the coil. So the magnet is now going in this direction. 
show on figure two the direction of the induced current as a result of this motion. Right, so if the, if the, if the magnet is being pulled out, the current is going to be going like this. And the galvanometer would actually be pointing to the right this time. Right, once again, you just sort of follow the direction and the magnets have been pulled out, the electrons being pulled this way. Five. State three changes or adjustments that Kevin could make in this experiment to increase the induced EMF. EMF meaning electromotive force, which is the same as saying voltage. So what can he do to this setup here to increase the amount of voltage? Well, basically what he have here is a kind of generator. He is using a force to generate current. And so what he could do is that he could move the magnet faster, right? So he could move the fa magnet faster in and out of the coil. He could use a stronger magnet right or he could even increase the number of coils like in a transformer so that'll be a three things here so one would be to increase the force of movement of the magnet two would be to increase the number of coils And three would be to increase the strength of the magnet. All those things there would lead to an increased voltage or increased current. So we can't say use a, 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 a battery of higher voltage because there's no battery here. What this basically is is a small generator where the movement of the magnet is what's causing the inducing the current. Right, so the next thing here is describe what will happen if the magnet remains stationary, which means not moving in the coil. Right, so remember I said here that it is the combination of three things that causes this, the combination of two things that causes this current. Um, there's the magnetic field around this bar magnet and there's the movement of the magnetic field. Those two things there help push the electrons along. If there's no movement of the magnetic field, right? Basically, you have a static magnetic field. You're going to have a static electric field, which means that the electrons are not going to move. So you're not going to see the galvanometer, the arrow move left or right. It's going to be pointing straight up. So what's going to happen is just one mark. There will be no induced current in the circuit. I could also say the galvanometer point straight up, basically in its neutral position. Right, so you need that magnetic field to be moving in order to generate a current. If it doesn't move, if there's no force applied to it, there'll be no current. Okay, so let's look at D. Figure three shows the layout of an AC generator. A coil P, Q, R, S is connected to other components of the circuit, which allow the coil to rotate in the direction indicated by the arrow. So draw on figure three, the direction of the induced current if the coil rotates in a clockwise direction. Okay, so first we're going to have to mark off a few things on this. I'm going to have to mark off the magnetic field, and the magnetic field goes from north to south. So the direction of the magnetic field, which is usually marked as a B, but I'm going to put M for magnetic field, goes from north to south, uh, and draw the direction of the induced current. So you could see here that the coil is turning, right? Like this here. Actually, I don't think I need to mark off all those things in a... Oh, I don't, because we have the galvanometer here to show you. But let me just make sure. 
Um, that is making sure. The, so down, the trust will be, so it's like thinning, so the trust will be up here and down here. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you didn't need to mark off any. Basically, you just had to follow. That's that's my bad. You didn't need to go through all of the work. Um, basically, what you just need to do is follow this galvanometer here. So you see it pointing this way. So you follow this. And the direction of the induced current will be what I'm marking in blue here. Going up like this, coming down like this. Right, so that'll be I. But let me, let me just double check it. Um, there's something, something a little wrong here just now, huh? Magnetic field. No, no, no. Is it next way? Right. So yeah, you did, you did have to mark all this off. So let me, let me, let me explain. Okay. So we see here that the trust is up and you have to use Fleming's left hand rule. So remember the Tom represents trust. M is the magnetic field. And the second finger is the current. Right? Trust or force, magnetic field, uh, and current. There's a lot of work just for one mark. But so this this arrow here this represents the trust. Because it's in the clockwise, it's good trusted up here and trusted down here magnetic field is north to south so you do your left hand to show the magnetic field pointing from north to south and the trust is up right so the trust is going up on the side so this side ps and you'll see that your finger your second finger will be pointing towards you so that means the current is coming like this So since it's coming down here, the current will be coming up here. Right? So you have to use Fleming's left hand rule to determine this. Alright, second one. If the period of rotation of the coil is 0 0.02 seconds, calculate this frequency. Okay, this is just a simple calculation. We will know that frequency is equal to one divided by the period, and that'll be one divided by 0 0.02. So in the calculators, let's work that out. That'll be one divided by 0 0.02, and that there is 50 hertz. Okay, let's look at the next one. If the speed and direction of rotation of the coil are constant, sketch a graph of voltage against time to show the output for the generator for one complete cycle. So just for one cycle, given that it starts rotating from its current position. Okay. So um, all we have to do here so we're gonna draw a graph. And this here is gonna be voltage. And it's gonna be plus N and the minus N. And this is gonna be time. And all they want is one complete cycle, so one oscillation. So we're gonna have to do this. So it'd be one cress and one trough. And that's it, that's the answer. If that asks for two, you draw the next one, but just one. Same thing as a transverse wave, right? But um, I guess you wanna make sure that the amplitude is the same on both sides. So you can't have one side tall, tall, and the next side short, short. All right, let's look at question two. Distinguish between transverse and longitudinal waves. Okay. 
transverse waves and transverse waves the displacement of particles is perpendicular to the waves propagation basically to how the direction moving there are crests and troughs when longitudinal waves this waves would be like light, X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet, and so on. Water waves. In longitudinal waves, the displacement of particles, so it's not perpendicular this time, it's parallel. The waves propagation. So these don't have ups and downs. They don't have crests and troughs. They, they have um, uh, compressions and refractions basically points at which the wave is denser or more compacted and where is more expanded or less dense example this would be sound and there are so one example of each so we could just put light for the transverse wave and sound for the longitudinal wave In the wave equation, velocity, frequency, and wavelength are related, right? The equation. Easy. We just have to say V is equal to F lambda. Velocity is frequency times wavelength. A wave motion has a frequency of 10 hertz and a wavelength of 250 meters. Give me one second. Eh? Okay. Right. Calculate the speed of the wave. Okay, so a wave motion has a frequency of 10 hertz and a wavelength of 250 meters. Okay, so... The speed of the wave is the velocity. So this is just using this formula and applying the, um, you know, we're seeing here. So this will be 10 times lambda, that's the wavelength, is 250. And you don't need a calculator to do this. The answer here is 2,500 meters per second. Right, so you just had to employ the formula and you get basic questions. Okay, let's look at this one here. Figure four shows a sinusoidal wave. Sinusoidal just means like S-shaped. And this is what the question is asking us to determine. So indicate on figure four the amplitude of the wave and use figure four to determine the wave's amplitude in meters its period in seconds and its frequency in hertz. Okay, one thing to note one time is that the time here is not in seconds, it's in milliseconds. And first, let's mark up the amplitude. So the amplitude is the distance between the highest point of the crest, which would be like here, and the neutral point of the wave, which is zero. So we're going to mark up this as the amplitude, and we'll just mark this as an E. The amplitude could also be this part here, the lowest point, and here. And this could also be the amplitude. All right, and you could also mark it here, but this one is just one mark. So what is the amplitude of the wave? So we could see here that the amplitude is 0 0.5 millimeters. We have to convert that to meters. The next thing is to determine the period in seconds. So the period of the wave will be the time taken for one oscillation. So of course, one oscillation, if we start here and we travel here, this is one crest 
and one trough and we end here so how long did that take so one oscillation took four milliseconds but they want our answer in seconds so we'll convert that just now so let's write down what we have so far the amplitude is 0 0.5 millimeters and the period is four milliseconds So let's put this here. So the amplitude is 0 0.5 millimeters. And to convert that to meters, we'll have to say 0 0.5 divided by 1,000. Let's work that out. OK, so this is going to be 0 0.00. 0, 0.5 meters. What about the period? So the period that we got there, the time taken for one oscillation was 4 milliseconds. So let's write that here. First, we need to convert it to seconds, so that'll be 4 over 1,000. And when you work that out, that's going to be 0 0.04 was it zero zero four? Yeah, sorry, zero zero four seconds. Now we have to calculate the frequency in hertz, and we did something similar already. So frequency is equal to one over the period, and that will be one over what we just got, got for the period, zero point zero four. 0 0.004, sorry. And what did you get for your answer? You're supposed to get 250 and make sure to put the unit frequency so your answer is in bits. So in this case here, it's more a matter of conversion than anything. state one property of an electromagnetic wave. There are many, many properties that we could use, but um, these are some. So we could say that um, they are transverse. They can travel through a vacuum. They all travel at a speed of three times 10 to the power eight meters per second in a vacuum. Anything like that would work, right? So they are all transverse. They can travel through a vacuum, so for example, light. And they all travel at the speed of light, so radio waves, microwaves. If you remember how to, you know, how to remember them from um, the lowest frequency to the highest. So remember, rich men in Vegas use expensive gadgets. And that would be radio microwave, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. And that would be from the lowest frequency to the highest frequency. And also the longest wavelength, which is radio, to the shortest wavelength, which is gamma. Easy, light, nice way to remember it. Okay, so here we have uh, um, here we have a nuclear physics question. Let me just take a look at it quick. Okay. All right, so let me read the question. Question three A. Elements with unstable nuclei are susceptible to decay. What is meant by the term nuclear fission? So remember, fusion is where you have two smaller atoms forming a big one. Fission is where the atom is split into two smaller ones. 
nuclear fission occurs when the nucleus of an atom splits into smaller atoms. State two advantages of utilizing nuclear energy, and we could compare it to using fossil fuels. So one is that nuclear energy is much more efficient than fossil fuels and produces more energy, more usable electrical energy. The second thing is that nuclear energy does not produce greenhouse gases. So it doesn't contribute to climate change. Workers in nuclear power plants need to be extra careful on the job. State one precaution that workers in nuclear power plants need to take. Right, so this is, again, is an easy one. There are many precautions that they could take so they could ensure to use safety forceps and tick gloves when handling materials. They can store radioactive materials in lead boxes and they can um, ensure to wear hazmat suits or they could use protective screens if they don't have the proper suits. Any one of those would work. The next question is, give two disadvantages of using nuclear reactors to generate energy. Right, so the first one is nuclear reactors generate large amount of nuclear waste, which is difficult to dispose of. So, so they don't produce greenhouse gases, but there's a lot of waste that they have to bury in lead boxes, lead containers, that, um, you know, there's, there's a limited amount of space they could have. The next one is that um, the risk of nuclear meltdowns. So for example, um, Chernobyl and Fukushima. Right, so there's always the risk of um, the human factor plays a, uh, plays a role here if there's um, uh, problems with maintenance or you have bribery and you know, all kind of different things. And or even like Fukushima wasn't really due to a human factor, that was due to the tsunami which impacted the power plant and that led to the fallout. So, but there's always the risk of that. Okay, so this question here, um, see, I'm not going to do this here, but I'm going to point it to your manual. And if you go on page, I have the same question here as the example on the manual. So if you go to page 93 on the manual, you will see the working for this question here. So I'm not going to um, spend any time here to work it out. So you'll see it step by step there. So this is, um, so if you go on page 93 of the manual, you will see the working for this here. It'll take too long for me to work it out in this video. But there you'll see it step by step, so you could attempt it when the time comes and then look at the, the um, working there and the answers. All right, so, but I could still do these parts here. So, actually, I don't need to because everything would be there. So, I'm going to skip this part. And this is our one part here state one use, one use of the energy released from this from the reaction. Well, was one use from these nu nuclear fission uh, for conversion to electrical energy in nuclear power plants? That's really the main use of it. I mean, you could use the energy for atomic bombs and things, but you don't want to put that as a as a reason, especially for the world going today. 
Okay. All right, so let's look at this question here. So question four. For a popular amusement park ride, patrons board a carriage at the top of a high tower and are subjected to a wild ride of terror. This is like a roller coaster. Name and state the Newton's law, which applies if the one carriage is moving horizontally at a constant speed in a, in a straight line. So this would more relate to Newton's first law, which if you remember says that, um, you know, an object traveling in a, in a straight line would continue to do so unless the external force acts upon it, right? So, and remember when it comes to all these laws here, you could always look at the back of the manual and you could see it here the object at rest remains at rest object in motion remains in motion and so on so let's put this law here so we gonna state the law that applies here an object at rest stays at rest an object in motion stays in motion at a constant velocity in a straight line unless an external force acts upon it. What this means, right, is that for the carriage, right, that the carriage will continue moving. So I'll go for the The carriage will continue moving in a straight line, constant velocity, until it collides with another object or is subjected to another force. Right? You don't have to put this part, but basically you just see the law. And unless the carriage was to hit something, it was to hit a dive or something, where it would accelerate due to gravity, it will keep moving at a constant velocity. All right, so the next thing here is name and state the Newton's law, which applies if the carriage is in free fall. So if the carriage is, is falling constantly, so you have to remember now that the other two laws, um, the other two are Newton's laws, which we'll see here, Newton's second law, says that um, F equals to ma, or acceleration is directly proportional to the force applied to an object. So basically, the more force is applied to an object, the more it will accelerate. If you push an object twice as much, it will accelerate twice as fast. And the third law, which is the most popular one for every action force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. So we will more use Newton's second law to explain if the carriage is in free fall. So free fall meaning like, you know, it, 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 it's zooming right now. Newton's second law, I should state that this is Newton's first law here. Right, so this will be Newton's second law. Now, what this states is the formula F equal to MA, or force is mass times acceleration. And basically what this is saying is an object of fixed mass force applied object is directly proportional to its acceleration. And what this means in terms of gravity, in terms of the carriage, when the carriage is in free fall, the force of gravity is acting upon it and the carriage accelerates downwards due to that force of gravity. Right? So when the carriage is in free fall, that's what's happening here. Um, 
you could also use Newton's third law to explain this, which I'll put on the side here. Newton's third law states that every action force is equal and opposite to a reaction force. Basically, for, the, for it to be in free fall, the gravitational force acting on the carriage will be equal and opposite to the carriage's air resistance, kind of like the parachuter. When you have the parachuter falling and you have the, the downward force equal to the upward force, where the net force is zero, and that means that the um, the the parachuter would be moving at terminal velocity. So either one could work here. Okay, so the next question is this. Calculate the length of time that the carriage in part A on page 14 is allowed to free fall if it reaches a speed of 64.8 kilometers per hour from rest. And they say use G as 10. Okay, so firstly we analyze, let me see what, what we have here. We have a time, we have a speed, but the speed is in kilometers per hour. So we need to convert this to meters per second. Again, we have an acceleration due to gravity. Remember, this, this is a, this is an acceleration. So let's follow A here. So what we need to do is convert this velocity. So we, what we're going to say is 64.8 kilometers per hour. So basically moving 64.8 kilometers in one hour. Uh, we want this to, we have to convert this to meters per second. So to convert this to meters per second, we'll have to convert this top part here to meters. So this will be 64.8 by a thousand. over one hour and one hour is how much seconds? So 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. So it'd be 60 by 60, right? Seconds. So all of this here is just to convert this to meters per second. So my calculator, what we're gonna do is we're gonna convert this to 60, this by 1,000 is 64,800. And 60 by 60 is 3600. So when we divide this, right, you're going to get a nice cool number. You're going to get 18 meters per second. So we're going to use that as our velocity. So we're going to use the formula acceleration is changing velocity over time. Remember, it's added from rest, so the change in velocity will be 18 minus 0, which is 18. And we're going to rearrange this for time, because we asked to calculate the time. The time is going to be delta V over And the change in velocity is going to be 18. So, but what, what is the acceleration? Well, the acceleration is the gravity, which is 10. So, therefore, our answer is going to be 18 over 10. And that's going to be 18. Sorry, 1.8. And make sure you have the correct unit. Meters per second squared. There 
right? So what I did here was I just used the formula for acceleration. Acceleration is delta V over T or V minus U over T and found for time. But the velocity, I had to convert it from this kilometers per hour to meters per second, which is what I did here. Because there's 64.8 by a thousand will give you the amount of meters divided by the amount of seconds in an hour. Which is how I got 64,800 over 3,600. That gave me 18 meters per second. So I just rearranged this formula. Got 18 over 10. And 1.8 is my answer. Okay, so this next question is, is a sort of tricky one. This next question says, determine the distance the carriage falls in B1. Now, in order for me to do this, I'm going to have to make a little drawing of the graph, right? So, if I was to graph this, right? And this represents the velocity, and this represents the time. So what was the carriage doing? The carriage was free falling. So it was accelerating as it was falling, right? Due to gravity. And we could draw acceleration on a velocity time graph as a line going up like this. Right. So basically, this would have reached a velocity of um, 1.8, which is what we just calculated. No, sorry. Not 1.8. It, it would have been 1.8 seconds. So let me just reiterate. So the velocity would have been 18 and it would have been in one point. I now realize that is something wrong. Sorry, this is just so it'd be 1.8 seconds, not um meters per second squared because you're working out for a time yeah sorry about that right 1.8 seconds so the time would have been 1.8 and the velocity is 18. so when we draw this graph now this would have gone up to 18 meters per second and 1.8 seconds here and distance or displacement in a graph like this if you remember your velocity time graphs what you'd have to do is you'd have to find the area on the discs right so you have to find the area of this triangle and just to reiterate the height of this triangle would be 18 because it went up to 18 meters per second and down here would be 1.8 seconds so the displacement is going to be the area of the triangle and that's going to be base by height over 2 and that is going to be 1.8 is the base times 18 is the height over 2. So let's work that out in the calculator. So you do in a calculator, open bracket, 1.8 times 18, close bracket, divided by 2. And your answer here is going to be 16.2 meters. Let me reiterate really fast why I did here. So the question is asking us to determine the distance the carriage falls. We know that the carriage is accelerating as it is falling because it's falling due to gravity. So what I did here was that I drew a graph to show that the line going up represents it accelerating and it reached up to 18 meters per second. It did that in 1.8 seconds. Right, so I had to do this to calculate. So basically, what we did was draw this graph, mark it off, and find the area under the line. So remember that displacement, whether it's a triangle or rectangle or trapezium, you find the area under the line, 
or under the arm, the graph, in order to get how much distance or displacement to travel from, it, from its initial point. And that's why I did here. This is a triangle. This is where it's based by height over 2. You do your work in. This is where you get here. The answer being meters because it represents a distance, not an area. Okay, let's look at this question here. Four factors of the surface of a material on which the absorption and emission of radiation are texture, rough or smooth, nature, dull or shiny, color, black or white, the area, large or small. So state with a reason the appropriate characteristics of two of the above factors in the design of a car radiator and the roof of a Caribbean home. So a car radiator has to be a good absorber or a good emitter. There's a difference between an emitter and a reflector. So just to give you a basic difference, so like a frying pan is a good absorber and emitter. It is able to absorb the heat from the stove, but is also able to emit that heat. Like say for example, if you were to touch that pan, it would get burnt. It's emitting that heat onto your hand. So all good absorbers are also good emitters. A reflector, on the other hand, does not absorb heat at all. So they don't absorb or emit heat. They just basically bounce the heat off of them. So it does not absorb at all. So just to give you here context of what are good absorbers and good emitters. So good absorbers here would be, um, they would be rough, they would be dull, they would be black, and they'll be small. And good reflectors would be smooth, shiny, white, and large. Large areas means that um, they reflect more than they absorb. So let's use that to answer this question here. State with a reason. So car radiators, they are meant to absorb a lot of heat from the engines. They're meant to be good absorbers. Therefore, they tend to be black in color and dull in nature. They also tend to be small and sort of rough, but these are the two we're going to use here, black and dull. They're not going to be shiny. And the roof of a Caribbean home, this is like a galvanized roof, right? Which, you know, will be shiny and it'll be large. The roof of a Caribbean home is meant to be a good reflector, basically not to absorb heat, you know, your house to get hot, hot. Therefore, they tend to be large in size, right, and shiny in color. In nature, sorry. So you won't see much people, for example, painting the houses black in the Caribbean because they tend to absorb a lot of heat. Right? So you want to say that the radiators are good absorbers. Two good reasons, black in color, dull in nature. Roofs are meant to be good reflectors. So large and shiny. Okay, B. The following data were obtained in an experiment using an emergent heater to determine the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. So the mass of can and water at the start of boiling, M1, is 0 0.28 kilograms. Mass of can and water at the end of boiling is 0 0.26 kilograms. That means that some of it would have turned to steam. The power of the heater is 150 watts and the time of heating is 5 minutes, which we could turn to seconds one time. And 5 minutes, we know in seconds, is 5 by 60 and that's 300 seconds. Using the data above, calculate the specific latent heat of vaporization of water assuming negligible heat loss is surrounded. Okay. So 
remember the formula to calculate this is E is equal to MLV. Right, E is equal to MLV. But we have a problem now. We want to find what is LV. So LV is going to be E over M. So how much is M? So we need to calculate what would the mass be. So the mass of steam is going to be equal to M2, sorry, M1 minus M2. Because somebody water would have boiled off. So 0 0.28 minus 0 0.26. And you know your calculator for this is 0 0.02 kilo. That will be the mass of steam. How much of the water would have boiled off? But what is the E? What is the energy? Well, that is not too, too hard to figure out. We just have to say energy is power by time. And power, in this case, is 150 watts. And time is 300 seconds, 5 minutes. So let's multiply that. When you multiply those two, you're going to get 45,000 joules. So what's left now is just to plug in those numbers. Is going to be 45,000 and M is going to be 0 0.02. Let's work this out. So 45,000 divided by 0 0.02, and your answer is going to be 2,250,000. And now you need to put a unit. So Energy is joules and mass is kilograms. So it's going to be joules per kilogram. And that is your answer. So here we had several steps to take care of. We need to figure out how much mass was turned into steam, which would have been the difference between these two numbers. We need to work out what is the energy, how much thermal energy was put into this um, water. And that would have been the power of the heater multiplied by the time. And then just use the formula E is equal to MLV to figure out the rest. Okay, let's look at this question here. The coil of the immersion heater was not completely submerged. Explain how this would have affected the value for the specific latent heat of vaporization obtained in B1. Okay, so if you have, uh, let me just see if I can draw this out here. This is like, imagine this is the, the container with the water. And there's the water. Typically, what you'd want is the coil to be fully immersed in here. Right, let's pretend as the coil. If the coil was not fully immersed in there, right? and the coil only part of it was touching the water and part of it was outside what, are, what does that mean that means that not all of the heat from the coil was going into the water some of it was being lost to the atmosphere so this is what we have to explain here it would have taken a lot more time right and a lot more energy to heat this water Right, because it wasn't. It's kind. It kind of like imagine you you you're cooking, you're boiling water in the stove, but the whole pot not on the stove. Like only half of the pot on the stove. It's gonna take a longer time to boil, and the other like the other heat that is exposed to the atmosphere that is gonna be lost to the atmosphere, not gonna go into the water that you're trying to heat. Right, if the coil was not fully immersed, this means that a large amount of heat that was meant to be used to turn the water into steam was lost to the atmosphere. As a result, the water would have taken a lot more time and energy boil and turn into steam. 
this would have increased the value of the specific latent heat. Right, the value would have been higher as a result. Because now you're not getting that, you're getting a lot of heat loss, you're getting a lot of heat loss. So, right, so that would have increased the amount of heat needed. And that is, so it have one more. Right. And that there is question five. Let's go to question six, which looks like a lens question. Right. So we did something similar to this already. Let me just look at the whole question. Okay. So we did something similar to this already. Um, they say using fully labeled diagrams, define the principal focus of a converging lens or a convex lens and a diverging lens or a concave lens. So, so this is a converging lens. Again, you have to excuse my drawing because I use a mouse. My mouse is a touchpad. And here we have the, this is the principal, this is the um, principal axis. And this would be the focal plane, and this is the optical center. And I'm gonna draw what the light rays would look like. So you have a light ray coming through like this. So we have a light ray like this one like this right so if i were to have a focal point f that is going to be the point at which all those rays are going to converge right so all i have to show is these rays converging to that point f right not the best diagram but you all would know already. And that would be for converging lens. So that's the, that's the principal focus. And I guess you would label, you know, you'd label this is the principal axis. This is the principal focus. Red mark F. This is the lens itself, the optical center. And if you could, you could label the focal length, but you don't necessarily need to. All right, so diverging lens. So this one here is thinner in the middle. All right, so diverging lens would look more like this. And this would be a lot harder to draw with a mouse. So I'll try. Right, so this is a diverging lens. And this would be the principal axis going through the center. And this would be showing the optical center. Right, this point here. And if we was to put the focal points here, we could put one here. And one of equal distance here. Remember, they have to be equidistant to each other. So you can't have one here and one far off, right? Okay, so remember in this case here, these rays are going to be not be converging, but diverging. Right? Again, I know not the best. So how you're going to do this is... You're gonna make sure, and I'll draw this as dotted lines. The line must originate from the focal point, and then solid line here, going up. Same thing on this side. Dotted, just to show it imaginary. Right, and that's to show it diverging. Label the same things, principal axis, fo principal focus, whatever you have to label. 
right? If you want to see better pictures of this, um, so of course you just start to go in the manual, and you'll see it right here. Right, so convex, you can see the three lines converging on the principal focus, and because the focal length is between the optical center and the principal focus, the distance between those two points. For the concave lens, you can see, again, you have the rays diverging instead, instead of converging. And to do that, you start drawing the ray from the focal point here on the opposite side. Okay, let's look at this question here. An object of height 7.2 centimeters is placed 18 centimeters from a converging lens that has a focal length of 12 cm. All right, so let's put that information here. So the object height is 7.2 cm. The object distance, which is U, is 18 centimeters, and the focal length is 12 centimeters. Right? So we have all our info there. Calculate the image distance. Okay. So we did something similar already. We need to use the lens formula to do that. 1 over f is equal to, remember image distance is v, is equal to 1 over u plus 1 over v or 1 over do plus 1 over di, either one. We have to transpose this. 1 over v will be equal to 1 over f minus 1 over u. Right, so what is F? F is 12 cm. So 1 over 12 minus, and what is U? U is 18 cm, that's the object distance. Do the same thing with another LCM. So what is the LCM of 12 and 18? What is the lowest number that both those could go into? So that would be 36. So 12 can go into 36 three times, and 18 can go into 36 two times. And this will be 1 over 36. Right? And remember that represents 1 over V. So therefore, V, the image distance, is equal to 36 over 1 or just 36? Right. So the next part here is calculate or determine, sorry, the magnification. So to do that there, we need to say, um, we know the image distance and we know the object distance, so we could just use those. So M will be equal to the image distance over the object distance or di over do. So what is the image distance? That'll be just what we just calculated, 36. And what is the object distance? That'll be 18. Once again, since this is cm and this is cm, this wouldn't have a unit. So 36 over 18 is equal to 2. So that means that the image is going to be twice as large as the object. Okay, so the next part here is to calculate the height of the image formed. So we're going to have to use the same magnification formula, but we're going to use image of our object, but instead we're going to use the heights. So we're going to say 
magnification is equal to height of image or h i divided by height of object right and we want to get the height of the image so we're just going to rearrange this to say the height of the image will be equal to the magnification times height of the object and from here it's easy the magnification is what we just calculated is two And the height of the object, what we could see here, is 7.2 centimeters. Well, all we have to do now is work this out in our calculators, 2 times 7.2, and the answer will be 14.4 centimeters. And well, that makes sense because if the magnification is two, the, uh, the um, image is going to be twice as big. And the last question here now is whether the image formed is real or virtual. Okay, so let's look here. So this is how you're going to tell if it is real or virtual. The object distance has to be more than the focal length, right? Basically, the object has to be placed beyond the, the, the principal focus. So if I, if I had a lens diagram like this, and these are the focal points here, F, the object has to be placed beyond F, right? So it has to be placed, like say, for example, here. Once it's, once it's past F, it will be real, which means that the object will be projected on the other side of the lens. If it's before F, the object will not be projected. It will be virtual. So in this case here, our object distance is 18, and our focal length is 12, so that means it's real. So you don't need to explain, they just wanted to know. The answer here is real. And that would be June 2017. All right, so let's look at the next one. All right, let me see if I could find some Jan ones. Okay, so this one here is January 2020, basically the year of when COVID start. And I'm going to skip question one because question one, as we could see, deals with drawing a velocity time graph, which is not, not hard and it will take too much time for me to do it here. So some of these I might end up skip because we, you know, we did a lot of these already. Um, define each of the following terms specific heat capacity. I'll just type them fast, I guess. Because we you, you can you can see that they ask this a lot of times. So specific heat capacity is defined as the amount of energy required to change the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one Kelvin. Uh, and define the specific latent heat of fusion of ice. Right. And specific latent heat 
amount of fusion is defined as the amount of energy required to change one kilogram of a solid to a liquid without a temperature change. Right, we did, we did those already. Okay, let's look at this question here. A block of ice which has a mass of 2.5 kilograms and a temperature of negative 10 degrees Celsius is placed in a container. And they give you info here, they give you the specific heat capacity of water, 4200 joules per kilogram Celsius. The specific heat capacity of ice, which is 2.1 by 10 to the power 3 joules per kilogram Celsius, so 2100. And the specific latent heat of fusion of ice, which is 3.3 .3 by 10 to the power 5. So they say calculate the following. The heat energy required to change the temperature of the ice at minus 10 degrees Celsius to ice at zero. Okay. So to do this, we have to use the formula E is equal to MC delta T final minus initial temperatures. So what is the mass of the ice? So the mass of the ice is 2.5. The specific heat capacity of ice, so that's C. So in this case here, you see it different from water. So this is 2.1 by 10 to the power 3. That's 2100. And T2 minus T1. Okay, so the difference here would be 0 minus minus 10, right? Because the final temperature is 0. And, you know, if you're minus or minus, you're, you're adding. So the difference in temperature here well, is 10. So let's work that out. So 2.5 times 2,500 times 10. So the answer here is 62,500 joules. That's how much heat energy requires for this ice, right? The next question is this. Calculate the heat energy required to convert all the ice at zero degrees Celsius to water at zero degrees Celsius. So again, this is latent heat, not specific heat capacity because it changes in the state of matter. And let's look at the latent heat value. It is 3.3 .3 by 10 to the power of 5. So we're going to use that here. So you're going to use the, the formula E is equal to MLF. And the mass was 2.5, right? The yeah, mass was 2.5 times 3.3 .3 by 10 to the power of 5. So let's multiply that. 2.5 times open bracket 3.3 .3 EXP. 5, close bracket, and you're going to get 825,000 joules. That's how much it'll take to melt all that 2.5 kilograms of ice. The next question here. The water in the container is now heated to a temperature of 80 degrees Celsius by an electrical heater in 600 seconds. Calculate the power output of the heater. Okay, so we know power is going to be energy over time, right? So what we need to do first is work out how much energy was needed to heat it to 80 degrees Celsius. So we're going to use the same E is equal to MC delta T, but we're going to do it for now for, for water. 
after all the ice melt. P is equal to MC T2 minus T1. Remember the mass of water was 2.5. The specific heat capacity of water is was not top of your head now is 4200. But they gave it there in the previous page. And the change in temperature would have been 80 minus 0, which is 80. So let's work this out. So we say 2.5 times 4200 times 80. And what the answer you'll get here is 840,000 joules. So that's how much energy, right? So this is not the power, that's how much energy. So now we have to work out what is the power. So the power is going to be energy over time. Remember, power is the rate of change, the rate of conversion of energy. How much joules per second? So the power is now going to be 840,000 divided by the time. Well, how much time passed? Well, they give it to us here, 600 seconds. So 840,000 over 600, you're going to get 1,400 watts. There's a lot of work to do just for three marks, but that's what it is. Next one here. State one assumption which must be taken into account in C1. Well, anytime you're dealing with heat, you're going to assume that all of the heat is, of course, going into the substance and not into the atmosphere. Right, and that a heater that there's no power loss in the wires and things like that. You notice that this is a question that frequency frequently comes up. That there was no heat loss in the atmosphere or to the wires in the heater. Right, so that, that is the assumption. So that was question two in Jan 2020. Let's look now at question three in Jan 2020. So this is a momentum question. So the question here now is to define the term linear momentum. Okay, so if you know the, remember the formula for momentum, right, is P for momentum is equal to mass times velocity. Right? But easy way to define it. We just say momentum is defined as the product of the mass and velocity of an object traveling in a straight line. Hence the term linear. State the SI unit for linear momentum. So we just sort of combine these two units here. Mass is kilograms, our velocity is meters per second. We could also use this unit here, or newton seconds, not newtons per second, newton seconds. All right, so the next one here is state the law of conservation of linear momentum. So you, you might remember this. Um, this states that the momentum before collision is equal to the momentum after collision once there's no external forces or losses in the system. The law of conservation of linear momentum states that the, that the momentum before collision is equal to the momentum after collision, given that there are no external forces or that there is a closed system. So the next question here is state two real life examples 
that demonstrate the law of conservation of linear momentum? It's a kind of broad question, but um, two good examples would be playing pool, like playing the game of pool. So one would be pool balls, each other on a pool table. Second one would be Newton's cradles, that's the one where the, the ball and them swinging back and forth. And then you, you could come and put other ex examples too, you have car crashes, like car collisions, um, trolley collisions like in the supermarket, um, marble pitch, like people playing marbles, all of those there are, are examples, so just a name too. I say can be creative, but you know, be safe with your answers too. Okay, so let's look at C. Trolley A and trolley B collided head on. Trolley A of mass 72 kilograms was moving. So I'm gonna mark off as a doing here. Trolley A had a mass of 72 kilograms. I was moving to the west at 5.5 meters per second. Trolley B has a mass of 69.4 kilograms and is moving to the east at 4.5. Okay. So they said calculate the initial momentum of trolley E. So that's easy. They say P is equal to MV. And the mass of A is 72. Uh, the velocity is 5.5. Let's have to multiply that. 72 times 5.5. And you're going to get 396. And make sure you have the unit. 72 um, is kilograms, meters per second. Okay, so remember one is moving to the west and the next one is moving to the east. So the one that's moving to the east, we are going to put a negative momentum because it's heading in the opposite direction. Okay, so let's work this out here. P is equal to MB. And the mass, is, the mass of trolley B is 69.4. But the velocity I'm going to put negative because it's heading in the opposite direction. So that's going to be negative 4.5. And our answer here is going to be negative 312.3 kilogram meter per second. So I'm gonna so type those two answers that I got there. I'm gonna type out all the information. So trolley A, momentum is 396 kilogram meter per second. The B momentum is minus 312.3 kilogram meter per second, right? And I'm gonna just put the mass and so on. Just in case I need it. So mass is 72 and velocity this is 5.5. This mass is 69.4 and the velocity is minus 4.5. Right. You see sometimes is 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 good to um write on everything. So I'm going to put this here. All right, so the next question is this. Assuming the trolley is locked during the collision and that they moved off together in one direction, determine the speed and direction of the joined trolleys immediately after the collision. Okay. So basically what, what they're saying here is that if you had trolley A, and let's, let's imagine this is A, and you had trolley B, right? 
right? And actually, I think uh, right, actually it would be flipped because trolley A was moving into the west. Right, so trolley A was moving to the west, and trolley B was moving to the east, and this would be before. And after collision, they want to know how it would be if both of the trolleys was locked into position, like they join up. Like if they was going to the left or the right or what was happening, right? So what we need to do, we already worked out the momentum of, of each trolley. So what we're going to see is this. The total mass of trolley A and B. So remember, they, they joined, we will find the total mass of them. And that's going to be 72 plus 69.4. So let's see how much is that. So that's going to be 141.4 kilograms. So if both of them are joined, that is their total mass. The total momentum of A and B. So this is why we, we got the momentum of both of them just now. So we got um, trolley A's momentum is 396. And trolley B's momentum is negative 312.3, which means we're subtracting that. So let's find that 396 minus 312.3 and we get here 83.7 okay so what do we have to do now well now we're going to use the momentum formula p is equal to mv but we're gonna solve now because what they're asking us for is the speed the velocity the v so v is P over M, which will basically be the total momentum divided by the total mass, what we just worked out. So the total momentum is 83.7, and the total mass is 141.4. Let's work that out. Okay, so our answer here is going to be 0 0.59 meters per second but they also ask us for the direction so we need to look now and see which trolley had more momentum what trolley a's momentum is 396 trolley b's momentum is negative 312 if you were to just look at the numbers 396 is more of course right so that means that it will be going off in the direction of trolley a and trolley a was heading west so you're going to say 0 0.59 meters per second west. Feel free to pause this video, rewind it, go back and try and work it out yourself and see if you got the answers that I got. All right, so let's look at question four. With the aid of a label diagram, state the two laws of refraction okay so what you what you're asked to do here is basically to draw let me say for example a block we don't have to draw a block really we're gonna draw a line that represents a boundary and we could see here that this on top here represents a and down here represents water. So that could be water or glass, just something denser than air. And we're gonna draw normal to this boundary, perpendicular line. And we're gonna draw an incident ray going from the air into the water. So actually, I'm gonna draw this in a different color.
and this is going to bend towards the normal. Right, and this here is our angle of incidence. And this here is our angle of refraction, sure, plus R. And we label each thing. So this is our normal. This here is our boundary. This is the incident ray. And this is the refracted ray. So now we have to put the laws. So what is the first law? So the first law says the incident ray, refracted ray, are normal or lie on the same plane, the same two-dimensional plane. The second law basically is how you calculate refractive index. It tells you that the refractive index is equal to sine i divided by sine r. Basically, um, this thing called Snell's law. So law two is Snell's law. It says the refractive index, the ratio that just means divided, signs of the angles of incidence and refraction between two media. Basically, n is equal to sine i over sine r. And that is the second law. So it basically just tells you if you just define, um, divide the sine of this angle by the sine of this angle, you get the refractive index. Okay, so the next question is when a diver under the sea shines a beam of light towards the surface of the water, the light does not pa pass through the air water boundary into the air above but reflects into the sea. Say the name of the phenomenon which occurs and briefly explain why it occurs. So basically, we have imagined that this is the surface of the ocean. The diver is shining a ray here. But instead of it, um, refracting and coming out is instead doing this reflecting uh, well if you know the the work you should know that that is total internal reflection so total internal reflection occurred and why does this occur so this occurs because the angle of incidence of the light ray I should say incident light ray was higher than the critical angle. So if the angle of incidence is higher than the critical angle, it doesn't refract, it instead reflects, and that's called total internal reflection. Okay, next one. Another diver shines a beam of light into the water to see more fishes, as shown in figure two. So here we could see that the this is the incident ray, and the angle of incidence here is 60 degrees, and we have an angle here, R. Given that A, I think just cut off here, yeah, just now, eh? I'm going to read it. Yeah, sorry about that. Right, so we have this angle of incidence here, 60, and this one here, R. And they say, given that the index of refraction for the water is 1.33, that's refractive index, the angle of incidence 60, calculate what is R. Okay, so we're going to use the formula N is equal to sine theta 1 or sine theta i in this case, but we're going to say 1 because 
we typically put the bigger angle on top and the smaller one below and obviously from the diagram you can see 60 is the bigger angle right so this top one here represents i and the bottom one represents r so you're gonna have to rearrange this to say sine theta 2 because we, we want to know as r is equal to sine theta 1 over n so theta 1 again i said is the angle is theta i right so this is going to be sine 60 divided by n, which is the refractive index, and that's going to be 1.33. So let's work that out in the calculators. And you have to make sure that the calculator is set on DEG degrees. So you have sine 60 divided by 1.33. And you can just put two decimals. When you, if you work it out correctly, you'll get 0 0.65. So this is not our answer here. What we need to do to work out the actual angle, R, is we need to say sine inverse, which is also called arc sine, 0.65 right so you put second function sign 0.65 and you're supposed to get 40 point five four degrees or at least close to that, depending on how you round it off. So again, it makes sense because if on top here, sorry, if on top here is 60 degrees and this is smaller, well, 40, right? Okay, so here we have a next lens question. Let me just take a look at it. I'm just looking at the rest of the questions. Okay. All right, so C, an object, two CM in height, is placed 10 cm in front of a converging lens with a focal length 6 cm. So we did something like this already, right? Um, calculate the image distance V. So again, feel free to pause the video when it's playing back and see if we can work it out. But we did things like this already. Um, so calculate the image distance V. So once again, 1 over F is equal to 1 over U plus 1 over V. Transpose 1 over V is equal to 1 over F minus 1 over U. We just have to replace the numbers now. So 1 over F. So F is 6. And the object distance is 10. Since the object distance is more, by the way, you, could, you know, it's a real image. The LCM of 6 and 10 is 30. 6 into 30 is 5, 10 into 30 is 3, 5 minus 3 is 2, over 30. So that means that V is going to be equal to 30 over 2. Remember, you just have to flip it, and you get 15. So the image distance is 15.
So uh, so when the next part is a calculate mag uh, magnification, which is just taken the image distance 15 divided by the object distance, which is 10. And yet magnification is just taking the image distance divided by the object. We just did stuff like this 15 over 10 is 1.5. No unit. And that's it for that question. All right, question five. Complete table two by inserting the missing logic gates, symbols, and functions. Okay. So the function of the first one is changes logic zero to one. Basically, it inverts. So remember, you only have two symbols, two signals in logic gates, one and zero in binary. So the one that that changes one to zero and zero to one is called a not gate. And the symbol is given as this. There's only one input. Looks like a kind of triangle. The circle on the end. So if our one is here, a zero comes out. If a zero is here, a one comes out. All right, so an AND gate has two inputs. And it kind of looks like a D. You know, with the OR gate, there's a little curve here, but the AND gate is a straight. So this is input A and input B. And we'll put the function just now. The NAND gate looks just like the AND gate. But there's a circle at the end here. Right, now this is A and B. Right, so what is the function? So this produces a logic one if both A and B are logic one. So like if you have a username and your password, you get to log in. With an OR gate, however, you don't need both of them to be one. Right, so this produces, hence the name OR logic one if either a or b is logic one right so like an example of this would be um if you have a burglar alarm and is installed any windows on the doors the burglar just has to just has to break one window or one door and the burglar alarm will trip off you don't have to break all the doors and all the windows Right, so it's either the door or the window and the burglar alarm going off. Okay, so the next question is this. With the aid of a circuit diagram, describe how an alternating or AC, alternating current, can be half wave rectified to produce a direct current across a resistor. Okay, so first what we're going to draw is our alternating current. Symbol looks like this. And we'll draw our resistor, which will just look like a box. Right, and what we'll need is a diode, just like a triangle, to align. Right, and we just need to have it, everything connected. Right, so here we have our AC source, our semiconductor diode, and our resistor. And what this will do is that 
So if we have a, a alternating current, typically you'll see it being depicted like this, like a transverse wave, where you have crests and troughs, where it is half wave rectified. Now you have to remember that this here is the positive end of the graph and this is the negative, right? What the diode does is that it ensures current flows one way but not the other way. So there's only one flow of current, so there's no trough, so to speak. So there's only flow across one end. And this is why it's called half wave because there's only half of the wave. And this, this actually becomes a direct current because there's no backwards flow anymore. So they say, describe how this occurs, it's five marks. So a semiconductor diode only allows unidirectional flow. That means one, one direction of current through the circuit. It would allow the electrons flow from one end to the other end, but not in the opposite direction. As a result, a direct current is produced. Right, so assuming it's like three marks for the diagram and two marks for the explanation, which is, you know, you just explain what it does. So you wouldn't need a diode, by the way, for a battery because a battery is already a DC source. You would need it like for your laptop battery. I should say um, you wouldn't need it for a dry cell battery. You would need it for like a laptop battery that you have to plug into your wall outlet because your wall outlet is an AC where your battery is a DC. So you need that to convert it. Oh, look, they, they asked for this here. Sketch the voltage time graph to show the expected output. So again, it is drawing a transverse wave and leave little gaps where the trough would have been. So I'll, just, I'll draw three. And that's what it will look like. Okay, so the next question is this. Draw a voltage time graph showing an AC source with a frequency of 5 hertz. So remember what this means is 5 waves per second and a peak voltage of 12 volts. So this is what we need to work out. We need to work out what is the period of this wave, right? So the period of the wave is going to be 1 over the frequency. And that's going to be 1 over 5. And that's going to be 0 0.2 seconds. So every 0 0.2 seconds, there's going to be one oscillation completed. So, and they say the peak is 12 volts. So our wave is going to look like this. Right, so it's going to come up to 12, come down like this, come down to negative 12, come back up. So there, there, what we have there, we have one oscillation completed. So let's draw next one. Come like that. Come down. I actually kind of amazed this coming out so good with just my laptop. So they have two and we could do one more. Right? So this this is what it will look like. And we have one more question. So this atomic physics question. Three emissions, alpha, beta, gamma, from a radioactive source are subjected to a uniform magnetic field perpendicular to their path, as shown in figure five. 
draw the three rays to represent the part of the three emissions alpha, beta, gamma on figure five as they pass through the magnetic field. All right, so you'll see something like this in my um, manual, but let me explain how this works. So just, just, to, just to remind you of the three different types. So alpha particles are helium nuclei, and those are positive. Beta particles are elect fast moving electrons. Of course, those are negative. And gamma rays are high energy electromagnetic waves. And those don't those those have a neutral charge. So here we have the radioactive source, right? And here we have a magnetic field. And gamma rays, first of all, they're not affected by uh, magnetic fields or electric fields. So they, those actually just go straight up. So those those just, they, they undeflected, they, they ignore this. So what happens to beta particles and alpha particles? So you need to use Fleming's left hand rule to figure out the beta particles. Beta particles is like a current because it's electrons. So what you'll do, is you do your Fleming's left hand rule, you'll see that the magnetic field is pointed in, right? So the X means in, and your thumb would be pointing up, right? So into your screen and up, and what you'll see is that your current finger represents the electrons, and that is moving to the right in this case. So that will look like this. And once you figure out that one, the next one is easy because alpha particles will just go the opposite way. Right? So remember the radiation is being trusted upwards, like where you see the gamma rays going. Your, and when you're doing this, your, your first finger, your magnetic field finger is pointed into the screen. So you look at where your current finger is pointing, it should be pointing to the right. And that's where the beta particles is. All right, so let's look at this one. The magnetic field is replaced by an electric field as shown in figure six. Draw the three rays to represent the part of each of the, of the three missions. Okay, so this one here is actually easier because here we have the positive and the negative already. So gamma rays, remember, is unaffected. So those just go straight up. Now remember, I said beta particles are electrons, the negative, so they'll be attracted to the positive. So you draw them going like this towards the positive. And alpha particles are positive, so they're attracted to the negative. But they are a little heavier, so they'll take a longer time to reach there. So you just draw it like this. Gamma rays are neutral, which is why they just go straight up, they're not affected. So remember, beta particles are negative, so they're attracted to positive. Alpha particles are positive, so they're attracted to negative. Very easy. Okay, let's look at this one here. An unstable isotope of lead, right? 210 undergoes exactly two sequential beta particle decays followed by an alpha particle decay to become stable lead. So we, we actually have this worked out in our um, manual, but I'll still go through it here. With reference to the information in table three, write the nuclear equations that will result in the formation of stable lead. So we want to get lead um, 206 from lead 210. So we start starting from lead 210. And they already told you how to write it. So, so they said the first beta decay equation. So first we're going to have 210. Right, 82, 
And this is going to be lead. PB. And this, this is undergoing beta decay. So remember when something undergoes beta decay, right? We write E zero negative one. And this is going to become something. So you're going to say 210 minus zero is 210. And 82 minus minus one is 83. And as you could see here, this is our element called bismuth. So you're going to put that here. So the second beta decay equation. So we're going to have bismuth now. 210. 83. That is undergoing beta decay to become something else. So doing the same thing. And 210 minus 0 is 210. And 83 minus minus 1 is 84. And you'll see from the table that that is polonium, PO. So this last part now, they say write an alpha decay equation. So we're going to write 210. We have to write these equations with my trackpad. PO. So you have to remember now what an alpha particle is. It's two protons and two neutrons, a helium nucleus. So that is four, two, helium plus and now we do this 210 minus 4 is 206 and 84 minus 2 is 82 and what 82 is lead so this is how lead 210 becomes lead 206 Again, this is in the manual. I just did it here just to have it here. If you're having difficulty with this, there's always the atomic physics video you could look at and you'll see my explanation of it. All right, so let's look at C. So we did something like this already. Calculate the energy given off in a nuclear reaction if the change in mass is 0 0.3018. So we need to use the formula E Delta E is equal to delta MC squared. And so the change in mass is going to be this number here in this unit U, but we need to convert it to kilograms. So we multiply it by this. Times 1.66 times 10 to the power negative 27. And C is squared, the speed of light squared. So C is 3 by 10 to the power 8. So 3 squared is 9. 10 to the power 8 squared is 10 to the power 16. So we're going to multiply all of this now. So if we did it correctly, we are supposed to get this number, 4.508892 times 10 to the power of negative 11 joules. And I believe that yeah, this is the last question of January 2020. So I think this would be a good place to, to stop for now. 
um, at the end here, I'm going to link some um, answers for other past papers. You can just view them. Uh, feel free to look over this video anytime and work out the, the question shown. Once again, the, the papers that were done in this video was June 2019, June 2018, June 2017, and January 2020. Okay, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.